it's holiday season time and let me just take the burden off that stress about what are you going to make, will it turn out, how am I going to impress like Aunt Mary and Uncle Joe, all of those things. We can take care of all of those things in this one video. the crispiest crackling pork roast you've ever seen oh i love this one it is so good i'm so happy i can share it with you guys let's get started on the stuffing part first i'm going to do a rice based stuffing one because you know like i'm half asian so you pretty much have to have rice in your uh thanksgiving christmas holiday season dinner lunch whatever you're doing but it also means that we can make it gluten free so if you've got some people that need gluten-free, this is a good stuffing for them. All right, the rice and a whole piece of star anise. And it's all these little details, these little bits and pieces of flavors and aromas that are really gonna make the difference here. So in that goes, and some chicken stock. Just stir that. And then once that chicken stock is bubbling away nicely, just turn the heat down, put the lid on, and there's not much rice in there, so it's literally gonna take like five minutes. So one of the things about having a whole bunch of people over, family, friends, friends of friends, someone's second cousin, is that you never know when allergies are gonna be an issue. So one of the great things about this stuffing is that it just happens to be gluten-free. As long as you make sure that you're using gluten-free soy sauce, also known as tamari. So in the meantime, let's do the rest of our filling flavorings. And I'm gonna start off with some very thinly sliced pancetta that I have here. Now I just want to see how much fat comes out of that pancetta before I add in any oil. Now I'm not getting too much fat out of there, so I'm going to add a little bit of oil. And some onions. And some garlic. Now just give that mixture a few minutes for that onion to get really nice and soft and sweet and for that pancetta to impart all of its porky goodness. So this is looking good. Just empty that out to a bowl. Now let's have a check on our rice. Star anise is already making my kitchen smell beautiful. Now just take the star anise out. Just use a fork to fluff up that rice. And now tip that in with your bacon. I'm going to season with some soy sauce and give that a good mix. Now I need to let this cool down before I add the rest of my ingredients, so I'm going to pop it into the freezer for a good 10 minutes or so. So in the meantime, let's talk about our pork. Crispy crackling. Now it is one of those pressure points for a roast pork at home and there is nothing worse than having a really soggy piece of pork skin on your roast pork. Particularly when you're celebrating and you're trying to impress people and you know you want cousin Martha to think you're the most amazing cook ever. Uh, so break it down follow all the steps, everything is really crucial here. Now for me, pork belly is like the ultimate piece of pork. It's juicy, it has beautiful skin that's just waiting to be crisped up. I want you to have a look at your pork though when you're buying it. So you want a really nice hefty piece, this is about two kilos, and have a look at the fat. Not all pieces of pork belly are created equal. Uh, you want a nice layer of meat, just a little bit of fat in there. Okay, so that's your pork belly. I want one two kilo piece and then I've got just a smaller little strip of pork belly that we're gonna put inside of the other piece of pork belly. You'll see what I mean. First off, we wanna create the kind of base for getting our really super crispy, crispy crackling. To do that, you're gonna need a ruler. And then my weapon of choice here is a Stanley knife. So I find even my knives at home just aren't kind of sharp enough to get in there and really get some nice score marks. So I always use a Stanley knife for that. And before you cut into that skin, I want you to have a look at the piece of pork belly that you've got and have a look at which way you want to roll it. Now I want a nice long piece, so I'm going to roll mine this way. And that means I want the score marks to go across like this. All right, so I've got that set up. Now take my ruler 
And what you want here is a score line that runs through the skin into the fat. The scoring, make sure you're getting lots of tight score marks. Like I'm talking, what's this? A centimeter, a centimeter along. Don't leave it up to the butcher or your supermarket, which usually only puts about like a score every inch of the way along. That's not enough. Trust me on this one. The whole idea here is that scoring the skin and the fat means that we're going to get a better render of the fat. So the fat's going to render out underneath the skin, the skin's going to get crispy and you're going to be left with just crispy skin and beautiful pork belly meat. And you want a thin enough separation that when you go to slice, it's very easy to slice into thin or thick pieces. You'll see how that works at the end, but a centimeter, my friends, that's what you want. Okay, so flip your pork over and then take that little random long piece of pork that I've asked you to get and just measure it out in here. Just see if it's long enough to fit the length of that pork belly. Mine's a little bit too long, so I'm just gonna cut this extra off. And then I don't want the skin for this middle part. So I'm going to just make a little cut in here and then just wiggle that skin along your knife to take it off. Now the other crucial element to making a success of this roast pork is salt. Salt and thyme, I would say, the two most crucial things. So I wanna be properly, this is a big hunk of meat, so I really want to be making sure I'm getting a lot of good seasoning in here. So I wanna season the meat side of the pork. So there are times probably when you wanna be trying to avoid salt, this is not one of them. If you want crispy pork crackling, you're just gonna to have to deal with the salt. Okay, so my stuffing is nice and cool. I'm going to add in an egg and the egg is going to act like a binder for everything. It's kind of the job that, you know, the breadcrumbs would do in a regular kind of stuffing. Just mix that through. Now to amp up the flavour completely, I want to add in some herbs. I've got some coriander. Some spring onion. And then one little ingredient that's going to add a whole bunch of wow. You'll see it just perfumes the whole pork, and that is some lemon zest. Ah, and already that mixture is smelling so amazing. Ah, yum. Now the other thing you'll need here are some lengths of string, which is twine. Now before I do anything else, I want to get my string all set up and in position. So I just hook that under and about there will do. I want to make sure that string is really giving our piece of pork a lot of support. So I'm going to use quite a few pieces here. Now you want to get this tasty stuff all over your piece of pork. Spread it out, make sure you've got a nice even layer. And then that little piece of pork belly is going to go into the centre. And by using these two pieces, just this little piece here is going to make all the difference with how tight your roll is going to be, also how the filling looks, that little, you want that sort of like round circular pattern in your pork. So all of this is not just about flavour but also aesthetics. Now this is going to get a little messy, but don't worry, we'll get there in the end. So just kind of lift up your pork belly on the side here and roll it over. And you want to make sure that you're getting a really nice tight roll here. And then what I like to do is flip the pork belly back over because I like to tie it on the underside because I find that's the part that really needs a lot of help. And now just lift up that string, fold it over a few times and then pull to tighten. Just tidy all this up by cutting off that excess string. Oh, and would you look at that, already a work of art. Sometimes it's just such a joy making beautiful things in the kitchen. Now transfer that to a tray. Now I did say that salt was one of the most important things for the success of this dish. And the other thing is moisture. 
or lack of moisture. So I really want to get that skin really nice and dry. Pat it down. Moisture, it is the enemy of cr anything crispy. Crispy chicken skin, crispy pork skin, anything. So make sure you get it really dry. So get in there like towel dry um, with some paper towel and make sure it is super bone dry. I can't even emphasize it enough, dry. And then salt goes all over that skin. I really want to get in there and rub it in all of those cracks. Okay, and to give this salt time to work its magic, we need at least two hours or overnight in the fridge would be even better uncovered because that air all around the outside of that pork is going to dry the skin out. The salt is going to draw out the moisture as well. It's all going to work to help us with our crispy crackling. So now the gravy. And what I love about this one is that we're not relying on that last minute getting the pan out and the pan juices and all that kind of stuff and then everything goes lumpy and then what are you going to do because like grandma's waiting for lunch. Uh, so let's make our gravy ahead of time. A day before, two days before, all good. I'm going to start off with some chicken wings. All right, so a big giant Asian cleaver is like not totally necessary here. Any knife will do, obviously. But you do want to cut those wings up into smaller pieces because getting that gelatin out from near the bones or in the joints is really important to getting a nice, thick, glossy sauce at the end. I'm just going to add some oil into a pan to get everything started. And in goes my chicken. Now a little pinch of salt here. I want to get these chicken pieces a nice sort of golden brown colour. You could roast these in the oven as well. But I always find around like Christmas time or when I'm entertaining, oven space is such a premium. So I like to keep that free. Once I can see a little bit of golden colour here, I'm going to add in some onions. Some garlic. Now here's where we start to make things a little special with some Asian flair. I'm going to add in some ginger, some star anise, we want some Chinese five spice and just this little dash of spice here is really going to give us a beautiful background flavour in this gravy. Just you wait. And then to add some sweetness and a little bit of an interesting flavour, I like to use a dark cherry jam. Any kind of jam is good here, but I particularly like a cherry or a plum flavour here. And for some colour and some extra oomph, I'm going with a Chinese char seal sauce. You can find that in the Asian section of a lot of supermarkets now or from your Asian grocer. Give all of that a mix. Now deglaze the pan with a little bit of Chinese cooking wine. This adds a really lovely fragrance and aroma, but of course if you want to leave this alcohol free, just leave it out. Now I'm going to season with some soy sauce. Again, if you're doing gluten free, make sure you're using tamari or a gluten free soy sauce. And now you want some chicken stock here too. We're starting off with quite a lot of stock here, a lot of liquid, but we're going to reduce it down so it gets really nice and intense. Now bring this up to a gentle simmer and then let it do its thing for about an hour and a half. All right, so it is smelling amazing in here. And while this stock has been reducing, I've just been skimming it every so often, just the kind of gunky stuff that comes up to the surface. So this is what we're left with, and you can see just how much that liquid has reduced and intensified there. It's looking good. So let's strain it out. And then press down on all of those solids. We don't want to waste any of that liquid in there. It smells so good. Now, we're not quite finished yet. Pour that into a smaller saucepan. 
Just bring that to a little bubble. And now to thicken everything up, make it really super glossy, I'm going to add some corn flour. Just whisk that in. Okay, and then just like magic, look at that. We have a beautifully thick, deep colored gravy. And let me see how it tastes. Oh, wow. The complexity of flavor in that is so amazing. You have that beautiful hint of Chinese five spice, a little bit of sweetness from the jam and the char seal sauce. Mm, just perfect. Well, not quite perfect. I'm gonna add a little bit of salt here. And that can be just kept in the fridge until you're ready to serve. Just heat it back up on the stove top and you're ready to go. So growing up in a half Thai, half Australian household meant that traditions kind of got a little bit confused, fused. <laughs> and uh, whenever we're cooking special occasion dishes in my house, it tends to be a little bit Australian, a little bit Thai, a little bit Asian. Uh, we don't discriminate. We are happy to have everything in the one dish. So that's why, of course, my roast pork has things like star anise in the stuffing, soy sauce, Asian herbs, and I'm flavoring my gravy with things like char seal sauce and ginger. I think it makes something really beautiful. You guys tell me. Okay, so thyme and salt and the fridge have worked their magic. And let's have a look here. You can see the moisture literally sitting on top there that's come out of the skin. And we wanna make sure we get rid of that. So give this guy a really good toweling down. Now pop your beautiful specimen here into the oven. 20 minutes, really high heat, and then an hour and a half at a slightly lower heat. Times and temps are on the recipe on my website. Okay, now take a look at this piece of art that is this pork belly. Oh. Is one beautiful piece of artwork here. Mm. Completely joyful. Now let's lift that out onto our chopping board. Okay, so let's take the string off before we get too excited here. Just pop that out. So now let's get in here and slice this guy open. Now, because we went to the trouble of doing our score lines only a centimeter apart, we've got plenty of opportunity here to slice. Wow, look at that beautiful little pattern in there. We've got beautifully cooked pork. And if you have a look at the top here, all of that fat has rendered out and we are just left with crispy, crispy skin and some beautiful juicy pork meat. I mean, that's pretty much perfect. <laughs> I am one very happy camper right now. That looks beautiful. Aunt Mary is gonna be very impressed. I don't have an Aunt Mary, but if I did, she would be very impressed. Now, don't forget our amazing five spice cherry gravy. Let's have a look and see, shall we? Such a good sound. Mm, even the smell, you know that little bit of lemon zest that we put into that stuffing and how I said it would make all the difference? Oh, it really does, beautiful. I mean, that crunch. Can't argue with that. Wow, the crunch just never ends and the flavor never ends. I mean, the stuffing with that smoky pancetta flavor mm. and then that beautiful sauce as well with that little hint of sweetness and the Chinese five spice. <sighs> this is one very Merry Christmas, I can say that right now.
Right, so I just had to eat some more pork again because I wanted an excuse to eat more pork. But you know what I love about this? It's like, it's a total mashup of like Asian crispy roast pork, which you find in you know Chinese restaurants, and a really beautiful home style English pork roast, I guess. Mm. I mean, it doesn't really matter. Asian, Western, English, Chinese, a little bit Thai, I don't know. It just tastes really good and crunchy. Listen to that crunch. Mm. The crunch that never ends. So good. This ham is very special. It is the culmination of like years of ham making. It is my actual ultimate ham recipe and I'm gonna do things a little bit differently to what you might have seen before. Stay tuned, I'm gonna show you all the tips and tricks. First up, we're gonna prepare the ham. So let's talk about the ham. Now I prefer a whole smoked ham with the bone in. The bone part kind of provides a little bit of a handle later on, you'll see what I mean. All right, so take your ham, and what we need to do here is take the skin off, but leave the layer of fat that's there. So start off by just doing a little ring around your handle. So just cut around here, and then go to the other side of the ham, down the bottom here, make a little cut just underneath the skin and then now you really want to get your hands dirty so just get your finger under here and separate the skin from the layer of fat try and do it in a really neat way without gouging too many bits out of the fat because the fat's actually what is going to be the kind of top layer the beautiful top layer of our ham so keep going right over the top here and you should be able to take that skin off in one piece. Now the skin is something you really want to keep a hold of because you're probably not going to eat the whole ham all at once, or you might, but uh, if you're going to be storing your ham over Christmas, you want to keep the skin to put over the top so it doesn't dry out. So keep a hold of that. Now we come to the scoring part. So this part's really important because it's gonna affect the look of your ham at the end. So this is where you decide, do I want a diamond pattern? Do I want a stripe pattern? Do I want no pattern at all? Uh, I'm gonna go with a nice clean line pattern this year. Um, so I'm gonna start off about here and do one stroke where I know I've got the right angle. And then now about a centimeter spacing, I just want some nice, straight lines all the way across. So that is your ham prepped and ready to go. Now I'm gonna put this guy onto a tray lined with lots of foil. So usually with a glazed ham, we do a bit of decoration, maybe poke some cloves in there, some cherries with some toothpicks, and then it gets a glaze and it goes in the oven. So this year I'm doing things a little bit differently. So one of the traditional ways to prepare a glazed ham is to have whole cloves stuck into the ham or, you know, little half cherries uh, with a toothpick in it. And one of the complaints I got every Christmas, I mean, everyone loves to be a critic, right? But every Christmas, it'd always be the person who would say, oh, you know, I chomped into a piece of clove or, oh, you know, I've got to pull the toothpick out. And so I thought, you know, how can we fix this? I want the flavor of the cloves and I want to add more flavor into the actual meaty part of the ham rather than there just being a glaze sitting on top. So of course, a marinade is the answer to all of those problems. And can I say, it adds so much flavor. I mean, I don't even know why I didn't think of it before, but now it's an essential every year. Uh, now, let's get on to making the marinade. I want some ginger first of all. And some garlic. And some Asian shallots. Look, you could use red onion or French eschalots as well. Just roughly chop those. And I want some red chilies here as well. These guys are not hot. They're just gonna provide more of a kind of capsicum, bell pepper kind of flavor, but you could make it spicy if you want to. And now for the spices. So we've got a really big hunking piece of meat here. So we really need to go with some really strong in your face kind of spices. And I want spices that 
remind me of Christmas. And to me, Christmas smells like allspice. So that's going to go in. And then of course, because you know I love to add Asian flavors to whatever it is I'm cooking, I'm adding some Chinese five spice. And actually the Chinese five spice brings a really beautiful, unique flavor to the ham itself. I really love it. And some ground cloves. And then now some brown sugar as well. And now a couple of ingredients that I think really help to get all our big marinade flavors into the ham itself. Um, first of all, some vinegar. This is malt vinegar. And now some spiced rum. So the spiced rum is actually going to add a little bit of flavor and the alcohol itself is a really good carrier of flavor molecules. So that's gonna help when the alcohol seeps into the ham with all those spices. It's gonna carry all that flavor in there. But if you wanted to leave the rum out, you could just add apple juice instead. And you want a little bit of salt here too. Now we just want to blend everything up. Let's have a look. And oh, you know, it really does smell like Christmas when I make this marinade. All those spices oh, and the spiced rum. Ooh, yum. Now spoon our marinade mix over your ham. Things are going to get messy here, guys. Just get in there with your hands and rub the mixture all over. Make sure you get some underneath as well. Now pour the liquid. Make sure you've got lots of liquid coming out all over the top of the ham because that's what's going to seep through into those little score marks that we've made. Now just wrap your ham up really nice and snug. Now, if you can be super organized, try and get your ham into the fridge overnight. If you're doing things last minute, look, two hours is gonna do. So, of course, as you guys would know who have been long time watchers of my channel, I like to confuse things a little bit sometimes <laughs> with my dishes and flavors. And that's just because purely being a little bit Thai and a little bit Australian, uh, you know, a few Asian ingredients seem to make their way into my more Western dishes. So that's why we're seeing things like ginger and Chinese five spice and chilies in my glazed ham recipe. So time to do our glaze and I like to keep things really simple here. I start off with a fruit base. So a jam and a juice. You could go with whatever kind of fruit that you like. I've done peaches, I've done black currant, I've done raspberry. Uh, this year I'm doing cherry. So I've got some dark cherry jam and some cherry juice. And to give our glaze some sweetness and some body so it kind of sticks and clings to the ham while it bakes, I need some brown sugar and some soy sauce because that's gonna give us not just a salty flavor, but a bit of an umami flavor as well. And some whole star anise because that's going to infuse our glaze with a really beautiful, unique Asian flavor. Now just bring this up to a simmer. I like to simmer it for about five minutes or so just to let the star anise do its work and to dissolve all of that sugar. So now let's take a look at our ham. This guy has been getting nice and tasty under that marinade. Now all of this stuff has already done its job. All of that flavor is in there. All of that liquid is seeped into our ham. So I just wanna brush the kind of roughage off. Now pop your ham onto another tray lined with foil. And then I like to wrap the bone end of the ham in some foil. Again, that creates a bit of a handle for us at the end. Now let's have a look at our glaze. All right, that's looking good. I'm just gonna pour it out into a bowl. And now the fun part, well, I find it fun anyway, but um, brush that glaze onto your ham. And now this goes into the oven about 45 minutes. You want to be basting it every, oh, every five minutes, 10 minutes. You cannot baste it enough. The actual ham itself is cooked, so it's not about 
cooking the ham, it's actually about getting that beautiful lacquering of glaze on the top. Now to go with our epic ham, we want to have the ultimate potato salad. And for me, there is nothing more ultimate than a Japanese style potato salad. It's kind of like a mix between a mash and a potato salad. Creamy, delicious, yum. Okay, let's get started on an ingredient that you might think is a little odd for a potato salad, but we're gonna make some pickled vegetables. Yes, pickled vegetables, they're gonna add tang and crunch to the salad really worth it. So I want some cucumber first of all. I'm using a Japanese cucumber here, but any kind of very small cucumber is what you want. Very thin slices too. And then you also want some shredded carrot and a good sprinkling of salt here. Now get in there with your hands and give everything in there a nice little massage. You want to kind of squeeze that salt into the vegetables. And these only need about 10 minutes, which is good timing because I've got some potatoes cooking here that should be done in about that time. There are so many different ways you can serve your ham. Simply with some bread rolls is perfectly fine, uh, but I do like to have a little side option. And for me, a Japanese style potato salad is just one of those joyful things on its own, really. Uh, but it provides a perfect partner in crime to a glazed ham because it's got that creamy richness. It goes so well when you're being luxurious with your food at Christmas time. Okay, potatoes are looking good. Now you want these really tender, more tender than you would for a normal potato salad because unlike regular potato salad, the characteristic of a Japanese one is sort of that little bit of creamy mash uh, texture. So you want these to kind of disintegrate a bit when we go to stir them. Now I like to mix everything through while the potatoes warm because they kind of soak up more of the flavour that way. So get your vegetables that we've had sort of soaking in that salt and squeeze out the liquid. You can see they've softened up beautifully in just that short amount of time. And now for all the flavourings. So I'm going to use a Japanese style mayonnaise here called Kewpie mayonnaise. It has a really lovely kind of tang to it which I love. But any good creamy mayonnaise you have is also fine. And I've got some chopped up egg, some spring onion. And I want a little dash of hot mustard here. And then my little secret ingredient is a little dash of vinegar. Again, to bring out the tanginess in the vegetables and the mayonnaise. As I keep saying, this should be a creamy mash kind of potato salad. Can you guys hear that sound? That is squelching. Yes, that is the sound of a really good Japanese potato salad. <laughs> Look at how creamy that is. And let me just try it out. Make sure it's good. Hmm. I always have to stop myself from eating the entire bowl before I get it out to everyone. Mm, that is so good. Yum. Creamy, tangy, and then you've got that crunchy vegetable in there. Maybe I'll just steal one more. Mm. Now just get that out onto my serving plate. Now I like to add a little bit of spice here, totally optional, but I'm going to use a Japanese sashimi togarashi, also known as seven spice. It's got things like, you know, chili powder, sesame seeds, some other little fragrant bits and pieces. And I just love the colour too. So just sprinkle that everywhere. And there you go, potato salad done. If you're doing this one in advance, just pop some cling film over the top, put it in the fridge. It'll keep for about a day, so no need to do it at the last minute. So now let's take a look at our ham. What a little thing of beauty this is. Look at that sticky glaze. Oh, just slightly charry at the edges. You know, this reminds me so much of Chinese barbecue as well. Oh, okay, so let's get this out onto a plate. You need a little bit of muscle here. Okay, so before we get to the slicing and eating part, let's have a look at all my bits and pieces. I have my potato salad. I like to also serve this with some bread rolls for, you know, mopping up all the sticky ham goodness or for making little ham sandwiches. And I also like some mustard as well. 
Let's dig in and have a look. That just looks perfect to me. Now for me, thin slices of ham are always good. My husband can literally eat his body weight in ham at Christmas time. So I try and control that, pull him back a little bit with uh, serving him some thinner slices. Uh, it also means that your ham goes a long way. So my five kilo ham today is great for, you know, 10, 15, 16 people to all be sharing. Uh, so it's a great way to feed lots of people at Christmas time. Or one very hungry husband. And that, my friends, is literally Christmas on a plate in my household. There's no Christmas without ham. There's no ham without Christmas. Ah, a little bit of mustard. Let me see. Do you know what makes all the difference here? And that is that marinade. So many ham recipes don't have the marinade, and I don't always do the marinade, but wow, when you do, you just get that beautiful cascade of spices, the allspice, the Chinese five spice, the cloves, plus the sweetness from our glaze. Perfection. So good. On that creamy potato salad, I mean, it's just nothing better. Yum. Sticky, honey glazed, hot smoked salmon. Yes, you can make this at home without special smoking equipment. I'm gonna show you how. And not only that, we're gonna make the most amazing prawn cocktail bao buns. And yep, I'm gonna walk you through how we make those fluffy buns from scratch. All right, so let's get started on the bao buns first of all. And I have to say, this is a very easy dough mixture to work with as long as you get all your quantities just right. So let's go through it. We've got some plain flour first of all. And to that I want to add my raising agents. So I've got some instant yeast. Now there are two types of yeast that you can get a hold of, dry yeast that is. There's instant and there's active. So the active will require you to bloom the yeast in a little bit of warm water to kind of get it started. Instant yeast, which is the one I'm using, can just go straight in the flour. So just be a little wary when you're buying your yeast. Now also some baking powder as well and some sugar. So give that a good mix. Just create a bit of a well in the center here. Okay, let's talk about flour for a few seconds here. So one of the questions I get asked all the time is, why are my steamed buns that I make at home a little bit yellow? They're not pure bright white like the ones in a restaurant. So if you want the really, really white bao buns, you're going to have to uh, head down to your Asian grocer and find the special steamed bun flour. Sometimes it's called Hong Kong flour, sometimes it's called bao flour. It's usually got little pictures of steamed buns on it. That one is the one you want to give you the really white buns. But I find it's very often difficult to get a hold of, so I'm just happy using plain flour. It means that my buns aren't gonna be bright white, uh, but they still taste good and they're really fluffy. And now our wet ingredients. So I'm starting off with some warm water and the warm temperature is gonna to help to get that yeast kind of going and active and alive and bubbling. So that's why we want the warm water. Uh, to that I'm gonna add some vegetable oil and a little bit of milk. So a lot of you guys have mastered my recipe for bao buns. I know because you've written and shown me and told me, which is really awesome. One of the things that you said though, was that it was very difficult for some of you to get a hold of skim milk powder, which is in my original recipe. So what I've done for this one is test one out for you guys using milk instead of the milk powder. So it might be a little easier for you. Now pour that in. start mixing through the center here and then keep mixing 
And once you kind of get to this stage, you want to get your hands dirty. Now I've got that mixture almost all together into one big ball. I'm going to tip that out onto my bench here. And this dough always starts out a little sticky, so I like to just dust with some flour and start kneading. Now a little bit of intuition here is needed. If the dough is sticking to the palm of your hand as this one is doing as I'm kneading it, I need a little bit more flour. So I'm gonna dust that. And now I can feel that that dough is coming off my hands very easily. It's not sticking, so I'm just gonna go for it. So you wanna knead for about five or 10 minutes. Just kind of like relax into it. Have a think about all the wonderful people you're gonna see over Christmas. All the not so wonderful people. <laughs> There's always someone's second cousin that you don't like. Now once your dough is looking fairly smooth and when you press down on it, it should bounce back. So that is looking nice and bouncy here. So I'm going to pop this into a bowl. Tea towel goes on top. And then you want to let that rise for about 90 minutes or until it's doubled in size. Now while our dough is doing its thing, let's get our cocktail sauce done. So cocktail sauce can mean many things to many different people depending on where you are. Mine obviously is from my childhood growing up in Australia with a little dash of Asian if you like. <laughs> um, so first of all, mayonnaise base for our Australian type of cocktail sauce. To that I want to add some ketchup. And then I always add a little spicy element. So for me, my coconut sriracha is the perfect thing to add in here. Uh, but any kind of chili sauce that you really love is great as well. It is also optional, you don't have to make it spicy. I think my Southeast Asian ancestors just rolled over in their graves then. I have to make it spicy, you don't have to make it spicy. <laughs> and a little bit of Worcestershire sauce. And some lime juice. I always taste this to see if I need to do any little adjustments. Mm, yum. That sauce just says to me, fresh prawns. And I can't eat fresh prawns without that sauce. Peas in a pod, these two. Now I always make a big batch of this to keep over Christmas because we're often eating seafood like prawns, salmon, makes a great dipping sauce for any kind of like seafood spring roll even. Uh, it's a really handy thing to have. Oh, sandwiches, so many different things. And now let's finish off our buns. Ah, oh, that smell of that beautiful proving yeast. Such a nice kind of bread dough smell. Mm, so good, so comforting. All right, let's get our dough out onto our bench top. You want to give this another knead to kind of knock the air out of it. So give it an even smoother texture, this second knead. Now just roll it out into a cylinder and cut that in half. Now keep one half under the tea towel so it doesn't dry out. And now let's pay some attention to this other half. So I want to give it another little bit of a knead and then roll this one out into a nice little cylinder main thing here is to make sure it's even because I'm just trying to get some even pieces here. Cut that in half and then cut each of your pieces in half until you've got eight little even blobs. Now I like to do this with a little bit of oil. I don't want to put any more flour on here because that's going to give us a kind of dry texture on the outside and I want a nice shiny texture on the outside of our buns. So just some vegetable oil. I'm going to rub my hands first and now rub one little piece. Sort of give it a spin on the countertop and you're aiming for a nice, neat, smooth little ball. Oh, that shape is so satisfying. Okay, put that down onto a piece of baking paper and then set that aside while we do the rest. So usually bao buns are shaped so that they're kind of like a sandwich or a fold shape. 
We're going to make some mini burger bun style bao buns today. Oh, that's a lot of bees, isn't it? Anyway, um, so we're going to roll them into a round circle. Actually, it's kind of easier than trying to make the little sandwiches. Now you want to cover these guys up with a tea towel and just let them prove for another 30 minutes. Okay, so these guys have had 30 minutes. They have grown in size a little bit. Let's get them steaming. Put them into your steamer. Leave a fair bit of space because they will expand. Just pop that over some boiling water. Lid on and then we just have to wait 10, 12 minutes until they're beautifully fluffy and big and light and very exciting. <laughs> the big reveal, always my favourite part. Oh, just take a look at those cute little buns. Oh, that smooth texture, perfectly light and fluffy. Well, we'll see, I'll show you in a little bit. Let's take them off. And then let's have a look inside. Just look at how fluffy and light these are. Oh, perfection. So at this point, you can actually freeze these. They freeze really well. And then when you want to go and serve them, you just pop them back into the steamer another 12 minutes and then they're ready for you to go. So it's a great entertaining kind of style of bread to make because you can make it all in advance. All right, let's get to the assembly part now though. So I've got all my little bits and pieces here. For me, it's got to be iceberg lettuce because in a traditional prawn cocktail, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, I've got my spicy sauce, I've got some crispy shallots, prawns of course, and some coriander. Now take yourself a bun and slice open. Definitely need a serrated knife here because these guys are quite soft and fragile. Open that up. Now I'm all about structural integrity when it comes to building any kind of bun, burger, sandwich, get quite pedantic about it. All right, a little bit of sauce first of all. It's gonna kind of hold and glue everything together. Some lettuce. The lettuce for me is always on the bottom. A couple of prawns. Sprinkling of crispy shallots. These guys add such a great little oniony flavor, but also some crispy crunch as well. Really good little addition. A nice little sprig of coriander. Of course, if coriander is not your thing, you can leave that out, replace it with any other kind of Asian herb that you like. And then a little bit more sauce on your top bun because that also is gonna hold everything together. Sandwich that on top. And there we go. Uber cute. So cute. I love these little guys. Okay, pop that onto a platter. Now you could do all of these up and serve them like this, or you can actually put your prawns out, all the little condiments out and the buns out. People can help themselves. Totally up to you. And there you go. My little prawn cocktail bao buns. Let's just see how we've gone here. That bun is so light and fluffy and that little hint of spiciness in that cocktail sauce and that beautiful crunchy onion and the lettuce and the prawn and everything. This really is great. Mm. So good. Now, don't go away because we're not finished with our little seafood extravaganza here. We're going to make some salmon. Beautiful, glossy, hot smoked salmon. It looks a little fancy, doesn't it? But I've got an easy way for you guys to make this one at home. A few little tips and tricks, a little bit of handiwork, and voila, you'll have an amazing salmon to share with family and friends. Now, I want to do my smoking mix first. So we are going to do some 
good old home style smoking without any special equipment, uh, with no massive big smoking machine or anything like that, we're gonna improvise. So let's start off with a little bit of tea. So this is an Asian style smoking mix. I've just got some black tea here and some spices. So I've got some star anise, some cinnamon and some Szechuan peppercorns. Now I want some brown sugar as well. I'm gonna add in some raw rice as well. So the rice is gonna kind of cut down on the amount of tea and sugar that's burning. I mean, I want a lovely smoky smell, but I don't want like an acrid burnt flavor <laughs> to my salmon. So the rice kind of helps to temper that a little bit. I just wanna give that a good mix. Now let's go through how we make ourselves a little smoker, just a wok and a few other bits and pieces. Now you've got your wok here and you wanna start off with some foil, two layers of foil. Don't skip the two layers because you don't want any of this smoking mix getting stuck onto your wok. It won't come off, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Now you want to make a little kind of foil bowl at the bottom here. Now pour in that smoking mix. Spread that out. And now what you want to happen here is you want a rack that's going to sit on top of that little bundle of foil that we've made underneath. Now I have a cake rack here. Mine wasn't quite large enough. It kind of was sitting too deep in the wok. So I just kind of shoved some foil around the outside of it uh, to make it a bit wider so that it sits nicely on top there. There you go. Now turn the heat on and just wait for little smoky tendrils to start appearing. So this method of smoking the salmon is inspired by Chinese style tea smoked duck. And what the smoke does is really bring you lots of little added kind of spicy and smoky flavors and aromas. And it just kind of makes everything a bit special. Now, let's have a look at this beautiful piece of salmon here. I've gone for a center cut because I want the fillet to have a nice even thickness through the whole piece. All right, so just pop that onto some baking paper. And now that goes onto our rack. Now pop the lid on and then you need about 15 minutes here for all of that spicy smoke to work its magic. So there are two types of smoked salmon generally, and that is the cold smoked salmon. That's generally what you would have on a bagel or on some avocado toast if you're in Australia. Uh, or there's hot smoked salmon, which is big fillets of salmon that are smoked. So you've got kind of like a cooked salmon texture but you've got a beautiful smoky flavor. Okay, so while that salmon's doing its thing, we're gonna make a couple of little extra bits and pieces. I need to make a little glaze here. So I'm gonna start off with some honey. And some pineapple juice. Some soy sauce. And a little dash of dark soy sauce. Now you just wanna heat this up a few minutes until that honey is kind of melted and softened down and everything is beautifully mixed together. So while that's happening, I'm gonna get some little pickled cucumbers done. This is a really quick pickle and it's kind of like a nice, refreshing, crunchy, tangy side to serve with your beautiful salmon. So just finely slice the cucumber. Pop that into a bowl. Now all we need here is some sugar, a dash of vinegar, and some salt. Now give that a really good mix, and they will totally be ready to go by the time our salmon is done. Now that glaze is looking good, I'm just gonna pour that out and wait for our salmon. Okay, so let's have a look. 
Now already that salmon has such a beautiful colour on it, we're going to improve things even more by adding our glaze. Generous brushing on top. Now I'm not too concerned about whether the salmon is cooked yet because I am going to put it under the grill so it will finish off cooking in the oven. Now pop that under a really hot grill for 10 minutes or until you get a really lovely colour on top. When you've got lots of people coming over, this is a great one to cook because you only have to worry about one big piece of salmon. You don't have to cook multiple small little bits and pieces and plate it all up. Everything just goes out and everyone can help themselves. Now, while the salmon's under the grill, I'm just gonna finish off my cucumbers. Let's give them a really good squeeze. Got some dill and some fresh mint here. I just want to finely slice that. Sprinkle that on top. Just toss it through. Just have a look at this. What a beautiful colour. Oh, such a treat to have this kind of salmon at home. And to have made it yourself. Okay, carefully transfer that over onto a serving plate with our cucumber. Final little bit of flourish here. Some finely chopped dill. A few little wedges of lemon. So there you go, glazed, hot smoked salmon, all done without a special smoker at home. I love when you can make do with what you've got. And let's just see how we've gone here. Oh, look at the color of that. Wow, I love that beautiful dark color on the outside. And then that wonderful, just light pink through the center is a work of art. Wow. That flavour is like nothing else. You won't even believe the amount of just that 15 minutes in that smoke, the amount of flavour that's gone through there. And you can kind of taste those aromatics like the star anise and the pepper and the cinnamon. It just leaves such a beautiful smoky finish. Mm myself a little pickled cucumber. Mm. Amazing. Just amazing. So this one can be served warm out of the oven or you can chill it down and serve it as like a cool summer salmon kind of dish. So a little seafood feast you can easily put together for people that you're having over this holiday season. My beautiful prawn cocktail bao buns, hot smoked homemade salmon. What a beautiful spread. Enjoy. I'm going to. <laughs> mm. Yum. Thai spiced baked cheesecake covered with beautiful berries. Oh, this is a show-stopping Christmas dessert. And then for something super simple and yet very impressive, my mango coconut trifle cups are one of those things that people will be talking about forever. Well, maybe not forever, for a little while at least. All right, let's do the base of the cheesecake first. This one couldn't be any easier. I start off with ginger nut or ginger snap biscuits. I really like this kind of ginger spiced flavor here, but a lot of people use digestive biscuits as well. That is totally fine. And we just want to crush these up. Easiest way I find is a food processor or a blender. And once you've got a fine crumb, just add some melted butter. And just, you just kind of want to mix that through till all the crumbs look a little wet, like wet sand. Mm. 
Already the smell of that ginger and butter, so good. Now get that out into a round cake tin. This is a spring form one, which just means it's got a little buckle on the side here, so it opens up. Easiest way for cheesecakes, I reckon. And you just want some baking paper at the bottom, and in goes the crumb. Now to spread that out a little bit, and then just use a flat glass to press it down. And this is the easiest way really to get right into those edges and to make sure we've got a very even base. Now just pop that into the fridge while we get the filling done. Okay, so I reckon baked cheesecakes is one of those things that even people who don't love dessert still love cheesecake for some reason. I mean, well, that's what I think anyway. Uh, but for my cheesecake, I'm obviously adding a little bit of an Asian twist and we're putting some chai tea style spices in here. And that adds something really special, I think. All right, so the filling, this one is super exciting. I love these flavors. So chai tea flavors plus white chocolate. Mm. So good. Um, let's go with the white chocolate first. I've got a bowl full here and the easiest way to melt white chocolate, just pop it on top of another saucepan filled with some water and just let the steam work its magic there. So while that's happening, just pop your cream cheese into a bowl. And I want some sour cream here as well. And now some caster sugar. Now you want to give all of that a good mix until it's nice and smooth. Okay guys, so this is a classic case of do as I say, not as I do. Uh, just some regular electric beaters would be great to use here. I just happen to, in my Asian kitchen, not have those because we don't do a lot of baking. So I'm using a little hand stick blender, but don't feel like you need that. You just need to beat the cream cheese with the sugar and the sour cream. So, you know, just a regular whisk or hand beater is totally fine as well. So this is the texture you're looking for at this point. Nice and smooth, no lumps. Now let's take a look at our white chocolate needs a bit of a stir to help it along. So once we have a nice, smooth, luscious looking melted chocolate bowl here, I'm gonna pour that into our mix. And then we also wanna go in with our flavorings and spices here now as well. This is what makes this cheesecake really special. So a little bit of vanilla. And then cardamom. It's this ground cardamom flavor and spice and aroma that really, I think, gives the cheesecake the chai tea characteristic. A little pinch of cinnamon, just a little bit of cinnamon because I want the cardamom to really shine through here. And some nutmeg. Now just mix that through again. Now I can never resist poking my finger in here just to give this a try at this point. Mm. Those spices, yum, and mixed with that cream cheese, mm. so good. All right, let's add the eggs next. And you wanna add these in one at a time and beat really well in between the additions. Now just grab your biscuit base and pour that mixture in. Now what I like to do here is just tap the cake tin a few times just to get rid of some of the air bubbles that might be in the mixture. Now just pop this on a baking tray and then pop that into the oven for an hour or until the middle is just set. You can find the times and temps on my website. So while that cheesecake is having its beauty nap, let's make some little trifle cups. And wow, this one to me so much says Australian summer. Mangoes, coconut, I mean, for me that is Christmas time. And I can't wait to share it with you guys. And it's super easy, all right. Because for me, desserts always have to be easy. Now, we're gonna start off with some mango. I need to make a puree, so I'm just gonna blend this up.
if it's not summer where you are and mangoes are not in season that is totally okay you can turn this into a berry trifle so just use raspberries for the puree and then you can add raspberries and blueberries throughout the rest of the trifle okay so that is the kind of smooth texture that you're after now I'm going to get that into a saucepan now I like to fortify my mango puree with a little bit of mango juice which helps the fruit go a little bit further as well when we're dividing it up. And then I want some sugar and some water. So this is going to form the base layer of our trifle cup. So what I want is to end up with like a firm jelly. So I'm going to heat this up first of all. Now my little special ingredient here to get just the right jelly texture is agar agar. Sprinkle that in whisk it through. All right, so agar agar instead of gelatin here is really great. That is such a funny word to say, a couple of words to say, but anyway, um, agar agar is plant-based. So if you have any friends that are vegan or vegetarian that are coming over for Christmas, then it's great to be using that instead of gelatin, which comes from animal bones. Now pour that out into a jug. Now we can pour the very first layer of our beautiful trifles. Now the other advantage of using agar agar here is that it sets incredibly quickly and even sets at room temperature, but I'm going to put it in the fridge just to speed things up, it'll only need half an hour. Now one last element, I promise we're going to make a little kaffir lime sugar syrup to drizzle on our cake in the trifle. So some sugar, some water, just get that bubbling away. And then the kaffir lime leaf, also called magrut here in Thailand. So I just want oh, about four large leaves. Now this brings a really beautiful, light, refreshing lime flavor to your entire trifle. But of course, if you can't get a hold of this particular lime leaf, you could use something like chopped mint or chopped basil, just to add a bit of like a refreshing kick. Now I've taken the stems out here and just roll these up. And I want a really fine chop here, just so they're like little sprinkles in that sugar syrup. Pop that into your sugar mixture. And once that sugar is dissolved, you are done. Let's pour that out and we wait to assemble. So after an hour, this is what your cheesecake should look like. A few little cracks around the edges, puffy, and when you just shake that tray, it shouldn't jiggle like it's all wet through the center. It should be quite firm. Now this isn't quite done yet. Shut the oven door and let that cheesecake rest in there for about an hour with the heat off. By that time it'll sink down and then pop it in the fridge. Okay, so I'm not a huge baker, cake maker, dessert maker, it's just not my jam. Uh, so for me, desserts have to one, be easy and something that I can put together fairly quickly so that I can concentrate on the rest of my entertaining or Christmas spread. So you'll find both of my little Christmas dessert recipes here to be very achievable, even by non-baker dessert people like me. So here we are with our cheesecake and after it rested in the oven, I popped it into the fridge to cool down because of course no one wants to be adding whipped cream to a hot cheesecake. That is going to be a recipe for disaster. Um, now let's get our cheesecake out. I'm just going to be using a butter knife to just kind of loosen it from the edges here. And this is where you cross your fingers and hope that everything has worked out well. Just release that spring on the side. Ah, oh, beautiful. Look at that lovely dark caramel color all over that cheesecake. That is just so perfect. Okay, get this out onto the plate that you're gonna be serving it on. 
And then now we come to the fun part, the decorating. Okay, start off with some whipped cream. I just whipped this cream with a little bit of icing sugar to kind of stabilize it and sweeten it a little bit. Now I like to have a little swirl pattern on my whipped cream, but totally up to you how you'd like to go about it. And now let's go in with our berries. I've got some cherries to start off with. And some blueberries. Some strawberries. some red currants for a Christmassy touch. Now I'm going to add a little bit of greenery here with some mint. Now you want to put a few berries around the outside here. And then a little bit of icing sugar dusted on top because it always makes things look a little bit more special. And there you go, Thai spiced white chocolate cheesecake with berries. Mm. Doesn't that look amazing? So festive and so easy to do. I mean, if I can do it, you can do it, I promise. All right, so time to put everything together and this is the fun and easy part. All right, so I've got my little mango jellies in here that have set nicely. And then check out our little spread here. What I like to do at Christmas time when you're you know, gonna be cooking a lot is take some shortcuts where you can. So I just have some store-bought cake that I've cut into cubes. I've got some meringues, some wafers. I've got some coconut chips, some little white chocolate balls. And then now it's all about putting it together. Got some whipped cream and I just want to dollop that on top of my jelly. Try to be neat about the size of the glass, but you know, do what you can. We're not a fine dining restaurant here. And then some fresh diced mango on top. And now for my coconut flavor, I've got some toasted coconut chips here, but desiccated dried coconut, any kind of coconut flake is great as well. And I'll just crumble that in. And now some of the cake. And then drizzle over some of that kaffir lime sugar syrup that we made. And I love how those little flecks of green and just like a little sprinkling of confetti in there. So festive. And now these parts are optional, but I like to have lots of different textures in my trifle cups. So I've got some meringue here and I'm just gonna break that into little bits and pieces. Sprinkle that on top. Oh, there's some little chocolate chips in this one. Nice, bonus. And now in a little dollop of cream. And then a wafer on top. And now another little optional because when you don't have to make these things, you can go all out with the decorations and the flavors. So I've got some little white chocolate balls here as well. And there you go, my little mango coconut trifle cups. These guys could actually be made the morning you want to serve them and just keep them in the fridge. Maybe take the wafer off, put that on at the last minute so it's nice and crunchy. Ah, summer in a cup, so gorgeous. 
Now for the all important tasting part, of course, to check and make sure I've done a good job for you guys. So let's just have a look at that cheesecake. Mm. That is such an amazingly beautiful and light cheesecake. But that spice flavor through there is so punchy mm. and just makes it a little bit different. Mm. Incredibly Moorish, my goodness. Mm. I love that combination. And now with your trifle cup, there's only one way to do this. You've got to get a whole cross section of all the bits and pieces in there. So you've got to get your spoon and get right down the bottom. Get some of that jelly. Mm. Perfect spoonful. All of those textures, you know, this is the thing about a trifle. You get all these little moving parts, you put them all together, and it makes something so beautifully harmonious. Yum, and that coconut and mango flavor. Mm. It's like pure sunshine. Wow. One of my all-time favorite things to cook in the holiday season, and that is crispy roast pork. This version is really beautifully slow roasted, so you get kind of like the crispy happening on the top, and you get that really juicy, soft meat on the bottom. Perfection. So what you don't want to be doing on Christmas Day is like totally stressing out. So you want to choose a menu that allows you to do as much of like, you know, the hard stuff the day before. So I have a little cheat sheet for you guys. Skip to this time code at the end of the video and I will have a step by step. Okay, do this, this, this the day before, do this, this, this day of. Easy. First up, we are going to be doing a crispy crackling pork belly. Yes, this one, my friends, all the crunch, but then all that really soft, juicy meat underneath because I've got a super special technique for preparing and slow cooking your pork. Let's get right into it straight away. First of all, we need to cut to yesterday, the night before Christmas, if you like. So guys, let's talk about pork belly first of all. Now, uh, in Thailand actually, we call pork belly mu sam chan, which is quite interesting because that means like pork three levels, which I think is cool because what you want are lots of levels. You want levels of fat, you want levels of meat, certainly you don't want all fat um, and you don't want all meat either. Make sure you get a good piece where you've got a nice balance of those levels, um, if you like, that's why I like to think about it anyway, uh, meat and fat. and. Um, Look, you can size this to how you like. So I'm doing like a big, this is like a 2.5 kilo piece. Ask your butcher to cut it to size if you want it smaller or larger. This one will probably do about six people. So the other thing about Christmas time is you've got a whole bunch of people coming over for the big lunch and the big dinner. Uh, but you know, budget wise, it's something you've got to kind of think about. Uh, you know, you don't want to be serving a big eye fillet for everyone or a standing rib roast. Um, you know, you can get quite a lot of servings out of a big slab of pork belly. It's rich, so you don't need a huge amount per person. Uh, and it is a cut that's a lot cheaper than some of those more expensive you know, pieces of meat. So a good choice for Christmas or the holidays. Uh, okay, so the way we prepare it though, uh, you need to start the day before. And um, the whole idea here is that I wanna get um, uh, as much sort of salting and drying as I can into that pork skin. That's gonna give us the best amount of crunch. So let's start off with the scoring first of all. Um, now, you need some school tools here. <laughs> we're not artsy and crafting. We're not crafting and artsing or artsing and crafting. We're not doing arts and craft today. <laughs> but we do, this is the way I like to do it. Stanley knife, um, much sharper than your average home kitchen knife and a ruler. You want to just put your ruler down and use that Stanley knife to score straight into the skin. And I like to do like half centimeter kind of intervals here. And you're looking to make sure that you're cutting through the skin. Uh, you don't want to cut all the way through the fat and into the meat. You just kind of want uh, the skin and the fat to get nicked by that knife. 
Now, the reason I like to do this, because even when I bought my pork belly from my butcher, he did offer to score it, but I do find, um, unless you have a very patient butcher, <laughs> that there's often just not enough scoring. Uh, the reason why we want so much scoring is that you want as much um, sort of you want as many openings as you can to allow the fat to come up from underneath the pork while it's cooking and then that fat will cook uh, and spread onto the top layer of pork and get everything really crunchy. So yes, there is method to the madness, always. Okay, now we've got the scoring done, let's get onto some seasoning. I'm going to use a mixture of salt and five spice here. I love a Chinese style five spice pork. To me it has such a celebratory kind of fragrance and aroma. Uh, so I start off with a little bit of salt, a little bit, a fair bit of salt. <laughs> It's such a terrible, it's so bad, isn't it? Like everyone, every kind of, you know, cook that does a show or chef on a cooking show always says a little bit of this, a little bit of that. This is a lot, a lot of salt and some Chinese five spice. Look, if you want to have a go at making your own homemade Chinese five spice, I've got a video on how to do that as well. Store-bought is totally fine though as well. So that goes in. Now flip that pork over because I want this lovely five spice salt only on the meat part. So just start sprinkling that over. And you're gonna need to do a little massaging here. Just really rub that salt and that spice all over that meat. Okay, so my family is half Thai, half Australian. So our Christmases are quite often half Asian, half Australian. <laughs> uh, we love to have, you know, a glazed ham, a roast turkey, but we also love to have Asian flavors. So what could be more amazing and impressive than a sort of Chinese inspired roast crispy pork with that Chinese five spice fragrance, you know, all of that just, it says, holidays, it says Christmas, it says family to me. Um, I love serving this one at Christmas. I hope your family loves it as much as mine. Okay, flip that over. Now the next thing we want to do here is make sure that our skin is really super dry, dry at all stages of this cooking process. Uh, so I'm going to get some paper towel and just wipe off Wipe off any of that spice that's on the top as well because the spice can, we're going to go really high heat on the top of this pork belly so the spice can burn. Um, so I like to get rid of any of that. Now really get in here and make sure that you're wiping off any moisture. So moisture when it comes to crispy crackling, moisture is your enemy. Any of that kind of liquid is going to stop that fat from crisping up. All right, now we just want plain salt on the top. So two reasons for doing the salt here on the top. Uh, one, salt is good, good flavour, and you know, to me, crispy pork crackling always has like a, you know, it's salty and you know, crunchy. But also the salt's going to help to draw out the moisture from that pork skin. And the more we can draw out the moisture, the crispier we're going to get. Okay, just rub that in a little. Now this guy needs a little beauty sleep in the fridge, uncovered, uh, that way we're getting more of that moisture kind of evaporating off in the cool fridge and we're going to leave that overnight. Your patience will be rewarded. See you tomorrow. Ho, 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 ho. All right, so pork belly has had its little time in the fridge and look, it's looking pretty dry to me right now. There is just a few little pockets of moisture here. So I wanna get a paper towel and really just make sure this is uber, uber dry. Couple more setup things before we get the pork in the oven. So I like to cook the pork on a rack just to elevate it above the bottom of the tray. So to make sure we don't get any kind of sticking issues though, I just like to lightly brush that with some oil or just paper towel it with some oil. Now the reason the roasting rack is a good idea is it allows the hot air to circulate all around the pork and you don't kind of get hot spots from the pork sitting on the hot tray. Now pork goes on top. And we're going to do a two-stage cooking process. So first of all, I want to take care of getting that meat really nice and tender and soft and melting, uh, as well as rendering some of the fat that's underneath the skin. So we want to go really low and slow for the first three hours. Yes, three hours.
three hours and you will have to put up with the amazing porky smell filling your entire house. Then we're gonna come back and finish off the crackling. So while your pork is in the oven, you can make this really beautiful homemade plum sauce, but you could also do this the day before, so that means you've got less things to do on Christmas Day. This keeps really well in the fridge. All right, guys, sauce. Okay, so I, even me, like I don't like to have that pressure of making like the pan sauce while Uncle Mary or, wait, no, Uncle, Uncle Joe, Auntie Mary. <laughs> that was a bit, well, you could have an Uncle Mary, I don't know. But um, <laughs> I don't wanna be there with the pressure on everyone looking while I'm trying to make the pan sauce and you know, that's when you're gonna get lumpy sauce, right? So this one's great because it's a sauce that you can make the day before or even like two or three days before. It will keep really nicely in the fridge and the pressure will be off, but still super impressive. Um, so what we need to do is Let's talk about some plums. First of all, we are making a spiced plum sauce. So these are some whole plums in juice or syrup. Either one is fine. You can get them in cans, you can get them in jars. Uh, you can even use cherries as well if you wanna do a cherry version instead of the plum. What I like to do though is get a hold of our plums and take them out of the syrup first of all. I like to be delicate with these. They are quite soft and I do wanna keep them in a nice shape for the end. Now all that juice or syrup that's left, that goes into my saucepan. And to that you want to add some sugar, some vinegar, a really good dash of fish sauce here. Now look, I know you might be thinking, wow, fish sauce, fruit, that's weird. Um, the fish sauce is going to give us a really salty plus umami savory flavor uh, to our sauce. I think it's kind of like the little hidden secret ingredient for this one. And then some spices. So I've got a cinnamon stick and some star anise. Now you want to bring this up to a little bubbling simmer and then cook it down for about 10 or 15 minutes. I want that sugar to dissolve and I want the whole thing to thicken up a little. It will thicken even more as it cools, but you do want quite a thick syrup to start with because the fruit, um, when we combine them together at the end, can make the syrup a little bit more watery. So we want to keep this nice and intense and thick. Now while that sauce is doing its thing, let's get these plums all prepped and ready. So just like to take the pit out from the middle, cut around the sides, open it up, and then just place those into the bowl that you're going to serve the sauce in is the easiest thing. And if you're doing this the day before, a really good idea is to keep the plums and the syrup separate uh, until just before or the morning of when you're going to serve, just because I do find that all that juice from the plums does kind of leach out into the syrup. Not a bad thing, but uh, I just like to have a nice, rich kind of thick syrup at the end. Now this is the kind of situation you're looking for with your syrup. I love that ruby red color. So thick and glossy. Okay, so let that cool down a little bit. Now once that's nice and cool, you can pour that over your plums, unless of course you wanna save it until later. I like to keep the spices in there as well. I think it looks really nice and it kind of tells people what the spiced flavor is in your lovely sauce. So there we go, that one is good to go. Time to do our beautiful, tangy, fresh Asian coleslaw. So guys, that pork is like uber rich. Amazing, but uber rich. So you kind of want something that's really sharp and tangy to cut through uh, all of that beautiful luscious lusciousness. <laughs> um, so that's why we're going with a non-mayo coleslaw, which is always interesting anyway because it's you know something a little bit different. Christmas salads. All right guys, so I know salads aren't like the sexiest thing in the world, but you know what, you've got to have some sides here. <laughs> that rich pork belly is crying out for something tangy and fresh. All those fresh herbs, that really beautiful tangy, just slightly spicy dressing, um, 
really cool combo with that rich fatty pork. Look, loads of other things are gonna go with this as well. Like I would probably serve like a sweet potato kind of casserole on the side as well. Um, some roasted pumpkin is nice. We call them pumpkin in Australia, you call them squash elsewhere. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> All those things, wonderful roast potatoes, also good. Um, mashed potatoes as well, buttery mashed potatoes, that would be good as well. Lots of different options here, you can take your pick. Uh, we're gonna make like a Vietnamese style nuoc chum dressing to start with. So I want some finely diced chili. Look, you wanna go with a mild chili here. This is like a really large, mild red chili. So don't worry too much about, you know, harming Uncle Joe with the spice level, <laughs> or Aunt Mary, or whoever it is in your family that doesn't like chili. Okay, and some garlic. Now in with our fish sauce. Sugar. And some vinegar. Now just to find a little bit of tang, I want some lime juice here as well. And then just give that a whisk. Now this you can make the day before as well. I'm all about the day before when it comes to Christmas. Uh, you can just keep this in the fridge and what I like to do is mix the coleslaw just before I'm ready to serve so I've got maximum freshness and crunch. Okay guys, pork currently smelling amazing. Uh, come in here and have a look at what's happening. So that, that, all those little cuts that I told you guys to take the time to do, look at all that fat just kind of seeping out of there, bubbling away. So that's coming up and out onto the skin. That's what's gonna give us the crispy crunchiness. Uh, now, we're not quite there with the crunchiness, don't worry. Just be patient, trust me. But have a look at the meat here. That is like super soft, gelatinous, amazing already. <laughs> My goodness, that is so, makes me so happy. <laughs> but what we need to do now is get that crispy, crunchy crackling going on. So I want you to turn the oven up super high, like 200, 220 Celsius. Uh, get that pork back in there. Look, this could take uh, up to an hour, but keep coming back to check. I like to like sort of swivel the pork around every now and again in the oven, you know, give it some love and um, we'll see what happens. Okay, come and have a look at this slab of perfection right here. Look, I don't even need to say anything. I just think you guys should just have a listen to this. Okay, so I'm cracking into this pork because, you know, I want to show you guys how amazing it is and I want you to hear that crunch and that crispy, all that crispy magic. What I like to do on Christmas Day though is actually serve this as a whole big piece. I love to do, it's like a show. You put on the Christmas show when the pork comes out. I love to get my knife in there and do that cracking at the table so everyone's like, oh wow, oh wow. You know, that kind of reaction. That's the one you want. That sound amazing it is literally like music play the pork drums all day but what would be better would be actually eating the pork um, before we get slicing though and crackling and all the wonderful things let's just quickly mix our salad first of all so onto the rest of the coleslaw now I've got some Chinese cabbage here also known as wombok also known as Napa cabbage um, look any Crunchy cabbage will do. You could do red cabbage as well, white cabbage, green cabbage. Um, I don't mind at all. <laughs> now I also want to load this up with lots of fresh herbs. So let's go in with some coriander. Now you can leave this out if you're not a coriander person. Now some spring onion as well. And some mint. I really love the mint here. It just adds such a big pop of like freshness and all the kind of, I don't know, lovely Asian kind of flavors. It's just, to me, it's like, I don't know, it smells like Thailand, Vietnam, you know, love mint. So you just want lots of that dressing. Let's give that a toss. Look at that. It's like, Christmas already, it's so Christmassy. <laughs> I love it. I didn't even mean for that to happen, it just did, wow. <laughs> love it, oh, those fresh herbs, the smell, the pork, the fresh herbs, the chili, oh, I wish you guys were here right now. Um, now, we've also got our delicious sauce here as well. Time to get everything assembled and out onto a platter. Shall we get back to the pork? 
Now, here we go guys, some more crunch for you. Wow, so you have a look at how juicy and soft that meat is. I mean, this is, oh, that's why we do the slow cook and then we've got the crunchy everything. Oh my goodness. Okay, let's have another slice here. I like to pop everything out onto a platter. generous little drizzle of that tangy sweet spiced plum sauce. I like to pop down like a few of the plums and some of the spices as well. So there you go guys, slow roasted spiced pork with that super crispy crackling, uh, our beautiful plum sauce and that herbaceous tangy little salad. Let me get into the main event here. I need to try that pork or I'm literally gonna die. Oh, it smells so good. Do you know what happens there? The meat literally just like melts away into this like porky heaven. And then the crunch, wow. Wow, this is such a wow piece, guys. Oh. I mean, I don't even need presents. This is it. If Santa brought this, I would be one happy girl. Merry Christmas, everyone. Enjoy your beautiful one. Here's my mouth. <laughs> <laughs>
pepper. I'm going to add some tomato in here as well. And now let's continue on with the funky Asian ingredients. I'm going to add some soy sauce and some dark soy sauce. Now this one here is mainly for color. So whether you're using a sweet, thick soy sauce like this one or just a regular Chinese dark soy sauce, doesn't matter too much. And some chicken or beef stock, either is fine. A little dash of sugar. So now we want this little cauldron of deliciousness to kind of infuse itself with all of its flavors, get a little bit more intense. So I want to simmer this for about 20 minutes. Nice gentle simmer. Okay, so while our lamb is doing its thing, let's do our fluffy, cheesy, buttery potato topping. So I just want to cook some potato here. I always like to add a little bit of salt to my water here. Just layering up the seasoning and flavors is always a good idea. And then just cook these until they're super soft and tender. And then we're going to mash them up. All right, potatoes are looking good. Just going to drain them off. And for me, the best part about mashed potatoes is the butter. So I'm not going to be skimpy with the butter. We're going to go in with a whole lot of butter. <laughs> a little dash of salt here. Let's get in here and get these nice and creamy. Now I'm going to add some grated Swiss cheese here. You could use a Gruyere, you could use a cheddar. Choose your own adventure when it comes to the cheese. And now, like any good fluffy mashed potato, you really just kind of got to get in there, give it some muscle, just whip it around, get that cheese melting. All right, so that is looking like so joyful right now. I'm gonna try some, obviously. Mm. That bowl needs to go like far away from me or I will continue eating all of it, mm, yum. Now let's come back and see how our little red meat sauce is going here and that is truly smelling really divine guys. I wish you could smell it. I'm going to add in a little bit of corn flour here that I've mixed with some water just because I want things to be all thick and glistening and sticky and shiny. Alright, so that is what we're after. Oh, that is just looking luscious. Yum. Now, you could go a couple of ways here. You could make a large baking dish full of this, pile the meat in, put the potatoes on top. I'm going to go a little fancy, make little mugs. And now for the fluffy mashed potato topping. And I am all about that creamy mashed potato, my friends. So we're going to go large with the potato. And now to really make these guys uber stunning, I'm going to add a little bit of an egg yolk wash to the top. It's going to make everything sunshine yellow and beautiful. And now into a hot oven until those tops are beautifully, deeply golden. Oh, wow, you know, the smell of these guys, you're kind of getting this like baked cheesy potato smell and then that beautiful spicy lamb sauce. Oh, I can't wait to dig in here. All right, just pop these out on a serving plate. All right, nothing else to do here except to try this concoction. I guess I can call it a concoction. But wow, oh, look at that potato and that lamb sauce. Mm. I'm really going to enjoy this. Holy smokes, that is so good. I mean, you get this huge flavor with the lamb and the spicy and the that chili paste mm. and then you get this really beautiful creamy cheesy potato layer i mean come on things just don't get any better than this whoa insanely good and you know what not obviously a traditional shepherd's pie but i don't know i think it beats my childhood version Mm. Yeah, totally does. Shh. Don't tell my mom. 
how do you get roast chicken with the crispiest, most golden skin and the juiciest meat inside? Well, I have the answers, everyone. This is my very best salt and pepper roast chicken. Now I'm going to do a salt and pepper flavor with mine, so a slight kind of little Asian flair. Uh, I'm going to start with some black peppercorns and I want some white peppercorns as well. So I like the mix here of the black and the white. I think you get a really nice, I don't know, kind of milder pepper flavor from the white and then a kind of harsher, also more spicy kind of flavor from the black. There you go. And just grind those up. Okay, so this is the kind of situation that we're after with our pepper. I want to keep it quite coarse because um, I really want those hits of pepper uh, when I'm biting into my chicken. And now I'm going to add some salt. Really good flaky sea salt here is, is what I love, but you know, you could use kosher salt as well. So we're not going to do anything super tricky or fancy here because quite frankly, we don't have to. Um, there are a couple of things we do need to do though. One, we need to fill the cavity. So you always want to fill the cavity of your chicken so that you don't get too much hot air cooking the chicken from the inside out. That is when you're going to get dry chicken. So I just want a lime or a lemon would be fine as well, or an onion even. And now trussing. So you don't have to get all fancy with the trussing either. All you really want to do is pick these legs up and kind of pull them together because you're kind of then making the whole chicken a bit more compact. Again, we're trying to make sure that things don't dry out. So if you've got some legs flapping around everywhere, then you've got more chance of things drying out. So pick the legs up and just tie them together with some string. Now make sure those wing tips are tucked underneath just like that. Alright, now we want to go in with our salt and pepper mix and we want a lot. So I pretty much want to use the whole lot all on this chicken and really kind of rub it in there. Give that guy some love. And that is looking very good. And now you want to go in with a much higher temp than you might normally think. So usually about 180 degrees Celsius is what is recommended in recipes. We're going to go in at 250 and that is 480 in Fahrenheit. So really hot. All right, so you guys know me by now. Of course, what am I going to have with my chicken? It's going to be a spicy dipping sauce. Uh, so we are going with a Thai style Nam Dim Dao sauce today. A really traditional kind of funky uh, spicy sauce. So first up we want some fish sauce and now I want some tamarind. So tamarind is an ingredient that's really sour and you can find it in like most Asian grocery stores or online these days and some brown sugar. So we've got the fish sauce, it's like salty, umami, a bit funky. You've got the sour tamarind, you've got the sweet brown sugar. Now we want to go in with some shallots. Okay, so this just needs to be roughly chopped. And I want some chili flakes here. As much or as little as you like, but this sauce traditionally should be like fire. Like it should be really hot. Um, so I put a fair bit in and some coriander as well. And then finally some lime juice. And let me just see if this sauce is tasting good because you always need to check for seasoning here. Mm, I love that. Whoa, it is spicy. Uh, it's got that really funky like like fish sauce, savory kind of kick. Uh, and then those shallots as well really kind of all just works together. That is one beautiful spicy sauce. All right, so now we're just waiting for our chicken. So at this temperature, your bird is going to need 20 minutes per 500 grams, uh, and that should work out to be perfectly cooked. Whoa, I mean, okay, come on, check out that chicken. That is really a work of art, amazing. Like that skin, that beautiful color, that crispy, salty, peppery goodness on there. Oh, Truly perfection. I'm so excited about this. Okay, so let's make sure that our chicken is cooked and I'll show you guys how we do that. Let's get the chicken onto a board. And then you just want to have a look inside this leg joint part here. Just cut that open and make sure all those juices in there are running clear. If they're pink, still not done, pop them back in the oven for a few more minutes. All right, so in an ideal world, you would let your chicken rest for about 10, 20 minutes. Um, 
really need to get dinner on the table at this point in time because as those of you with toddlers would know that you kind of get to a witching hour point of the day where the screaming doesn't stop. <laughs> so I'm going to get my chicken carved right now. Um, all right, so I'll break this down for you guys. Really simple way to carve a chicken. First of all, we take those strings off the legs. Okay, now legs first, cut through here. And now legs and thighs are always in high demand at my place. So I try to, you know, divide them up in as many pieces as possible. So we want to get the drumstick first and then cut that thigh in half. Look at that glorious chicken skin. And now we want some wings. Now you want to slice through that breast. Try to make sure you're not disturbing too much of that beautiful crispy skin. You want each piece to have a nice whisper of skin there to crunch through. And then just slice that breast and there you go. All right, quick word about what we've got left over after we've carved our chicken. One, you have a pan full of like schmaltzy, yummy, salty chicken fat. Do not waste that. You could make a pan sauce out of it or I like to save it and kind of toss some potatoes in there next time I'm roasting and get them all chickeny and salty and yummy. So save that. Uh, and then we have the chicken carcass. Put that in the freezer and make yourself a chicken stock at a little later date. Uh, roasted chicken carcass always makes for great stock. All right, but let's get to our roast chicken. All I need to do now is get my spicy sauce on the side. And there you go, guys. The very best roast chicken I know how to make, and I am super excited for you guys to try this one. Uh, but let me try this first so I can tell you all about it. Now, I know that you guys know that I'm a legs and thighs girl, so that would be cheating to try that. I am gonna try the breast and tell you how well we've done with the juiciness. Let's have a look. Okay, I'm telling you, like, you know, chicken breast gets a bad rap. I promise you, if you do it just like this, it is insanely good. That is so juicy, it literally could be a piece of thigh. I mean, out of this world good, guys. Ah, oh, so good. Let me get some spicy tipping sauce, too. Mm. Now, that really makes me one very happy girl. That salt and pepper chicken flavor, that really juicy breast, and then that spicy kick of flavor. Wow. Just wow. I mean, yes. So looking forward to dinner tonight. The creamiest coconut ice cream and only four ingredients, no machines. Guys, we're gonna do this and make them super cute. These are my coconut ice cream pops. And is yours got unicorn? Yeah, mine's got unicorns. So I got yours. Same as yours. Yummy. Great. One of the things that makes this coconut ice cream a little special, I think, is the palm sugar that I'm gonna be using. So palm sugar used a lot in Southeast Asian cooking, particularly in Thailand, where my mum is from. And it will come like this, usually it's kind of in firm little mounds or bricks. And what you need to do is just finely shave it. That'll allow it to dissolve a little easier. And now the reason I love to use palm sugar for this is that you kind of got a little bit of a subtle molasses flavor, not too strong. And so it has just a slightly different kind of flavor characteristic. But if you can't get palm sugar, just go ahead and use a mixture of light brown sugar and white sugar. Now that just needs to go into some water and then you just wanna bring that to the boil, let it simmer for like literally a couple of minutes just until that sugar dissolves. Syrup is nice and cool. Now I want to whip it together with some cream. So the whole idea with no churn ice cream is you need two things. You need some aeration and that's what this whipped cream uh, situation is going to do. And then a little bit later on, I'll show you how we get the velvety smooth situation. So cream first, and this is just regular pouring cream or in Australia we call it thickened cream. And now your syrup. And here's one of my other little secret ingredients here, a little pinch of salt. Salt is one of those things that brings out even like the magic in sweet dishes. It kind of makes the sweetness sharper and more intense if you like. Now you wanna whisk this until you've got really lovely, fluffy, firm peaks. So 
So now we've taken care of the light and airy aspect. We have our whipped cream. What we want to do now is take care of the smooth and velvety consistency. So what we do to get that is we use a good old can of sweetened condensed milk. Uh, very simple, it has a very low water content. Water is your enemy here because water, too much water will give you those ice crystals that you don't want in ice cream. So I've had this guy chilling in my fridge for a few hours now and actually that's quite important. You want all of these ingredients to be cold, the cream, the sweetened condensed milk and the coconut cream. So anyway, condensed milk into your bowl and then add in your coconut cream. And you can see with the coconut cream, you kind of get a little bit of that firm coconut fat on the top. That's all good. Uh, it will be like a little bit separated down the bottom, but we're gonna whip it all together anyway. Now, this doesn't look the prettiest just yet, but give it a really good whisk until it's nice and smooth and it will look all the more beautiful. Hold on. So you don't want to ruin all the work you put into getting that beautiful aeration in the cream. So we want to combine this gradually. So you want a spoonful of your whipped cream into the coconut mixture. Now just fold that spoonful through and then maybe one more spoonful here. And what we're doing here is we're kind of lightening the mixture up before we start adding in the rest of the whipped cream, which will mean everything just stays more airy and fluffy and lovely. Okay, now we can go on with a lot more. I'm gonna go in with half of this mixture. Fold that through. And now the other half. Now you can go your own adventure here, guys. You could pop this into a loaf tin and that way you can scoop up lovely soft airy balls of ice cream. Or if you've got a toddler like me and also a big kid husband, you might wanna make uh, these coconut ice cream pops. So what I do is I just grab like some of these like little paper espresso cups and just scoop up the mixture into each of those. Now like just check out how fluffy and creamy that looks and smooth. I mean it already just looks like beautiful soft serve ice cream. I mean you know it's going to be good when it looks this good before it's even frozen. Now some paper straws in the middle and then into the freezer overnight. Okay, sit down, I'll get the ice cream. So our little ice cream pops have had their overnight rest and now we're at the fun part, the decorating part. So there are so many different ways you can go your own adventure here. I'm gonna choose two different ones here. I'm going for an adult version and a kiddo version. My adult version is some toasted desiccated coconut. So I'll just get that out. And then I've got here, the cutest little things, uh, unicorn confetti. I mean, when I was little, there was just, you know, hundreds and thousands or plain, you know, confetti. Now there's unicorn ones, so cute. <laughs> so here are our little ice cream cups. And to get these out, you just want some water that's just been boiled, you know, quite hot and grab a cup by the stick and dunk it in. A few seconds is all you need. And then just twist and pull, and there you go. You could actually just leave these just as they are. I mean, they're so beautiful and flavorful, but let's get in here with some dipping and rolling. Okay, so just roll around in the coconut, and then onto a tray. And one for the kids. Now the great thing about these is you can get them all out onto a tray and then back into the freezer so that they're ready to go whenever you're ready to serve. So I like to get them all done at once. So there you go guys, four ingredient ice cream, no need for a machine and well, let's just go in here and make sure that it's really good for you guys, shall we? Now, I know I said adults version, kiddo version, but you know, the kiddo version is just so much more fun. So I'm going in with that one. Mmm, mm. excuse the crunchy unicorns, but that ice cream, the ice cream itself is so creamy and it's so smooth and so velvety, not an ice crystal in sight. Mmm, honestly, I could eat so many of these. Just listen to that sound. Now let's get going on the pork first of all. So our Asian style porchetta um, has a really beautiful fragrant spice paste through the center. Uh, so first of all, we wanna start off with these dried red chilies. Now I have had them soaking in some hot water for about 10, 15 minutes. So they're lovely and soft. 
And what you want to do here is try to use the large dried chilies because they're typically a lot milder. Um, and this isn't too, it, really, it's not spicy at all, guys, as long as you're using a milder chili here. Because I know at Christmas time, you know, you've got to count for everyone's tastes here. So a nice mild one and just squeeze out that liquid. But I want you to keep that chili soaking juice because we might need to use it a bit later when we're blending. You just want to cut these chilies up so that the blender has an easier time getting through them. Pop them into your blender. Now, next up is some galangal. Uh, so for those of you who might not be familiar with galangal, this is the guy here. Um, kind of looks like ginger, but more pink. And it has a very kind of like, it's like a fresh kind of pine like piney, citrusy kind of fragrance to it. If you can't get galangal in your local area, just use some ginger. Um, different flavor, but still good. Now you do need to cut the skin off. Now guys, you know that I love to hear from you. You know that I love to chit chat here uh, on my channels with you. So while you're watching, why don't you tell me what it is that you're making this Christmas or what your family loves to make at Christmas time. If you've got photos, even better. I love to uh, take a squeeze at what everyone is cooking or what they'd like to cook. And also I love to hear about where you guys are watching from. And I know that all of you will have lots of different Christmas traditions. So please tell me all about them. Or better yet, post me a recipe. That would be great. Now we also need some lemongrass. Just need to like bruise that lemongrass. And then often like that first layer is kind of like really woody and hard. So I just kind of peel it off. You can go ahead and slice the inside. Now I also need some red shallots here. Some garlic. Some coriander roots. Now, I know a lot of you often comment that your local store or market gets rid of the root end of the coriander. If that's the case, just use the stem that you've got. The stems and the roots have loads of flavor uh, and it's very nice to use in a paste like this. For those of you who don't like coriander, just leave it out. It's okay. I feel sorry for you, but it's okay. <laughs> now, I also want some magroot lime leaves here as well. Just gonna take the sort of middle stem out of those, just kind of rip them into that blender. I also want some lime zest too. And now some shrimp paste. So this is basically very much like a uh, Thai red curry paste if you like. The shrimp paste will add a whole bunch of like beautiful umami and saltiness. It is kind of a stinker though. So don't smell it. <laughs> or you could like dare someone in the family to eat a jar of it or something which we often do to you, Dax, don't we? We ask you to eat a jar of it, but you have yet to eat a jar of it. I told you my price is $1,000, I'm sorry. $1,000? <laughs> $1,000. You give me $1,000, I'll eat a whole shot. Like a, yeah. the whole, yeah, this yeah, whole yeah, thing? Can, yep, you can broadcast it and everything. <laughs> okay, guys, you let me know. $1,000 bonus. Who wants to see Dax eat a whole thing of shrimp paste? <laughs> I don't know if I want to see that. <laughs> okay, let's go in with our spices now. I've got some ground cumin. I want some ground coriander too. Now I just need to blend everything up. Now this is where we can use our chili soaking liquid because the extra moisture will help the blender kind of grip better on the ingredients and make it a bit smoother. I like the chili liquid because um, it's sort of flavored with the chili already and that water will actually evaporate off when you kind of sear the curry paste. Uh, unlike an oil, some people add oil when they're making a curry paste, but the oil kind of emulsifies, I think, and changes the texture and flavor. Uh, so I much prefer the, the liquid. Okay, let's blend this guy again. All right, let's take a look. It smells so good. Very fragrant. Now you want that kind of like chunky, well, not chunky, just like sort of homemade curry paste kind of texture, I think. So we've done our paste, let's talk about the pork belly. I mean, you know, it's wondrous when it's done really well. So how do we minimize 
uh, the uh, potential for disaster at Christmas time. Well, I've got lots of little tricks up my sleeve, um, including using one of my favorite pieces of kit actually in my home kitchen. Literally, I use this thing like every weekend um, uh, in my barbecue and in my oven. It's my um, meter thermometer. It's wireless. It will tell you all the things while your pork is cooking, but we'll get to that later. Um, the thing that you need to look at when you're buying your pork is you want to make sure you've got a really nice piece. Um, I've got about a two kilo piece here. Um, and by nice, I mean you want some good layers of meat and you know a layer of fat, but not too much fat, I think. Um, you want it nice and meaty. Okay, so you'll notice that I have this uh, little random piece of pork belly here. <laughs> there is method to the madness, my friends, and we're gonna be using that later to sort of stuff the inside of the rolled pork. Uh, you get a much better shape, I find, when you have this little piece in the middle, but we'll get to that later. First of all, let's talk about scoring this guy. So I like to be very precise with this. Uh, <laughs> The scoring is really important because you don't want to cut too far down into the fat because then you'll have too much possibly liquid sort of coming up and um, bubbling over and, and not giving you a really good crackling. I like to go, I like to use a ruler <laughs> also <laughs> because it gives you more accuracy um, and just sort of like half a centimetre apart. And yes, I'm using like a Stanley knife, a craft knife because it's very sharp and does the job. Okay, so that's our scored pork. You can see we've got beautiful even lines here and that's gonna help us to get a really beautiful, even crispy crust. Now with our little piece here, I do wanna take the skin off. So the easiest way to do that is cut through on the end here, flip it over and then sort of like hold the knife at a 45 degree angle and then just wiggle that skin. So far, so good. Now let's get our paste onto our pork. So I want you to save some of this paste, about a quarter cup for a little sauce we're gonna make later on. So the rest of it can go onto the pork. And just smooth that all over the pork meat. Now our little piece goes on the top and then you just roll that pork over. And so now you have a really beautiful situation here where you kind of have that piece of pork through the center and then you've got that lovely paste around it. So that'll give us a really nice amount of flavor all through the center there and gives us a really nice kind of rolled tight pork roll. All right, so to secure and tie everything together, I have a little trick here. So um, take yourself uh, a fairly long piece of string, fold it over and then just slide that under pork roll and you just you just want this piece to be able to come up into the center so just pull that up pull the end pieces through and then if you go like that and you've got a nice little tie okay okay so then if you go this way put your finger there and then roll that under and through here and you're looking really nice and neat and tidy here. Okay, so I'm gonna run out of string here. So if that's, that happens, just grab a bit more. Okay, that's looking good. Now do the other side. Okay, so now you just kind of flip this pork over and you can just tie it up underneath. So now this is very neatly, beautifully tied. Um, I'm gonna pop it onto a tray lined with some paper towel. Now we wanna get a lot of salt on here. So the salt is gonna help to draw out the moisture from that pork skin. And of course, the more moisture you can draw out and take away from that skin before you roast it, uh, the crispier and crunchier it's gonna get. So 
that's what we're aiming for. And that's also the reason we're gonna leave this in the fridge overnight, uncovered please. If you put a cover on it, what'll happen is the moisture doesn't have anywhere to go. Um, so by leaving it uncovered, we're kind of drying out that pork skin. So, overnight. But luckily, I did make one yesterday so you don't have to watch paint dry. Uh, let me go get it. So this is the one that I did yesterday. You can see that that skin is really nice and dry now. Um, the salt has sort of pulled out a lot of that moisture. So this is good to go. Now, the thing that I think is a little tricky when you're doing big cuts of meat for, especially for things like Christmas and Thanksgiving and holidays, is you really don't want to stuff it up. <laughs> So I'm going to say I love using this wireless thermometer. This is a meter plus. Um, it is wireless so you don't have all the cords and everything hanging out of the oven, which you can get tangled up with, which I do all the time with old thermometers. Um, with this one, you have this neat little probe. Pop it into your joint of meat. So let's get this pork out onto uh, our roasting tin. I've just put a little bit of like pieces of foil in here. That's just to act like a trivet. So we've got a nice amount of airflow going around. So pop your pork onto that. And then you can use the meter app to tell you when uh, it's reached the perfect temperature. So this will give you um, internal temperature of the pork. It will also give you the ambient temperature in the oven. And I gotta say, I find that really super helpful because ovens can say one thing and actually they're a different temperature. Uh, and that's the same with smokers and barbecues as well. So I really love that. And then you don't even have to kind of guess or figure out the timings or the temperatures. So you go pork and I'm doing a roast belly and go recommended temp. I start the cook and then that's it. This is going to tell me when my pork is ready. Um, but if you don't have a thermometer, the approximate times are going to be 20 minutes at 200 Celsius to start off with. That's going to get the crackling going. And then it's about an hour and a half um, at 170 degrees Celsius. So turn that temp down, but we'll come back and check it. I'll show you what the crackling does after 20 minutes. Okay, so this is what we're looking like after 20 minutes. We've kind of got that pop, like the crackling's just starting to go. Uh, so that's what I was hoping for. And now I wanna concentrate on developing that crackling further, um, but also cooking the pork all the way through the center. All right, into the oven. Okay, so stuffing. Um, I don't think that I ever used to make very good stuffing. <laughs> or, or I never had a good stuffing. Like I always thought stuffing was really bad. Anyway, this version, I have to say, I love this version. It is so interesting, but still has that like beautiful comforting kind of stuffing factor. You'll see what I mean. Uh, now this also coincidentally is very good to make the day before. It'll reheat beautifully. So I'm gonna start off with some oil. Now we're gonna go in with some Chinese sausage. I guess the first of the untraditional ingredients. Um, so if you've ever had Chinese sausage before, it's also known as lap chong. Uh, it is like this sweet, porky pop of deliciousness in any kind of dish, usually in fried rice, typically, actually. Uh, but it's really good in this stuffing. So pop that in. If you can't find lap chong, you could use um, some diced pancetta uh, or some bacon even as well. Now for my other little uh, secret, not so traditional ingredient, we're gonna go in with some smoked chicken. Uh, now that might seem a little unusual, but smoked chicken kind of, it gives you this really great interest that is more than bacon. You kind of get like these little pops of savory smokiness throughout the stuffing, which is so cool. Love it. Now you just wanna give uh, that pork sausage time to kind of render out its lovely fatty flavor. Now we're going to add some leek. Some celery. Now I know a lot of you out there will have some really great stuffing recipes. Don't let our, my earlier comment 
put you off by um, thinking that I don't like stuffing at all. I just think that I've been to some, I don't know, I just have had bad stuffing experiences. But please tell me all about your stuffing recipes. I would love to know um, some cool ones. Pop the recipe below, that would be really fabulous. I need some garlic here as well. Now I've got some shiitake mushrooms here as well. I've just had these soaking, um, so they're really nice and soft. These were dried shiitakes. If you had fresh, you could use those as well. Hi, darling. Hey, how was school today? Yeah, quick, come give me a huggy. Come on. Hey, did you have a good day at school? Oh. I love mommy. Oh, that's very nice. Thanks, honey. Do you have a fun? Does it smell good? Mommy smells beautiful. Oh, I smell beautiful. That's very nice, honey. I'm making some Christmas stuffing. Mushrooms. Yummy. Yummy. That smells yummy, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, now you're going to go for a swim or do you want to help me do some cooking? I want to go for a swim. Is it okay if I go for a swim? It's okay, yeah. And then you can have some, maybe try some stuffing later. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, that's a little present. Do you want to take that? Huh? Oh, off you go. Huh? Take this with you, please. Come on, go show Daddy. Okay. All right, so let's have a look in here and you can see that we're getting some beautiful caramelization in here and this sort of brown edge of caramelization that we've got, that is pure flavor. Now the best way to utilize that flavor is to deglaze the pan. Now that's just like a fancy way of saying, add some liquid, the liquid will bubble and take off all of that flavor and put that into our dish. So we're gonna do that with a little bit of Chinese Shaoxing wine. And see that bubbling, how it kind of lifts that caramelization off the side. So that's what we want. Now I've also got some chicken stock here. I've had um, some ginger slices sitting in there. I just warmed it through a little to kind of infuse the ginger into there. I'm going to pour that in as well. Now you can take those ginger slices out because they have already done their job in the chicken stock already. I'm just letting this simmer a little bit more just to pick up some of that flavor, but I don't want to lose all of that liquid. So I think that looks pretty good to me. All right, turn that off. Now, bread. So that's gonna be the main sort of basis for the stuffing. So I have here kind of like a stale-ish, kind of day-old sourdough. I'm just gonna rip that open. And you just want to cut slash tear this into chunks. Now just for some crunch factor here, I've got some water chestnuts and I'm just going to um, just literally just crumble them in. I like this to be really chunky and, um, and rustic. So, you know, don't go all fine dining on me here. So I have my bread here and I'm going to get it into here, mix it through. I'm also going to pour in some melted butter. And you just kind of want to keep turning this bread over in here so it starts to really soak up that liquid. And also I want to cool this down a bit. I need to add some eggs, but I don't want to add the eggs in while everything is super hot because then we're going to get scrambled eggs, which is not what we want for this. Now a couple of eggs here. Okay, so this looks like it's pretty good here. I'm gonna add in my eggs. And I want some salt, some white pepper. Do you think maybe it's an Australian thing, Dax? Like, do you think, to, like, to me, like, stuffing is like, you know, the stuff you get in, like, the rotisserie chicken, and, like, that's, like, pretty much it, right? Dude, like, so my grandma used to have stuffing sandwiches, and it was the most revolting <laughs> thing I've ever seen. Stuff. And she didn't have teeth either, so it was, like, like, double gross. Oh, <laughs> this is so fun, like, Christmas stories with Dax. <laughs> All right, let's get this into the oven. It only needs about 25, 30 minutes or until it's got a lovely golden top. Um, so let's pop that in. All right, so this is currently smelling so delicious. I mean, it's just so comforting, this stuffing, even the smell of it. Now, if you were making this the day before, leave it in the pan, and that way you can just cover it with foil and reheat it when you're ready to go. Um, but when you are ready to serve, what I like to do is dig out sort of chunks of that stuffing. Make sure you get lots of that crusty top on there. Ah, oh, so good. Okay. 
And then just a final little sprinkling of coriander. You could also do spring onion as well, so either one. Here it is guys, this is my smoked chicken and shiitake stuffing. All it needs now is our beautiful Asian porchetta. So let's finish that off. So our pork is nearly done. It is literally killing me with, <laughs> with all that. You know when you're cooking pork belly and the whole house just smells so delicious, you wanna eat your arm? I mean, this is where we're at at the moment. Um, pork is smelling amazing. We're gonna make a really quick sauce and you could do this the day before as well, guys. Um, it's, I love to get everything done as much as I can beforehand. So I just want a little bit of oil in my saucepan here. And you know that extra paste that we kept earlier? I hope you kept earlier. <laughs> Um, just pop that into the pan and you want to always with curry paste uh, you, you want to cook out the aromatics so you've got raw garlic in there you've got raw galangal um, lots of bits and pieces we want to really make all those flavors bloom and get all beautiful and lovely just like a minute a couple of minutes and I'm now smelling all those wonderful aromatics uh, so now I'm going to go in with some coconut milk and we're going to season this up with some palm sugar. And some fish sauce. Now just let that simmer for another five or so minutes just to allow all those flavors to make friends in there. All right guys, so here we are. Our sauce is looking and smelling amazing. I'm just going to pour that into a little dish here. And that is ready now for our pork. All right, so I am pretty happy with this pork. I mean, look at that, the perfect crackling. Look at all of, oh, that is so good. <laughs> I love it when things turn out so wonderful. And do you know what's really great is I know that that um, pork is cooked right through the center because my meter app told me so. Now, I know the temptation is to get right in here because it looks incredible, but <laughs> you really do want to let this rest um, like any piece of meat. I would let it rest for at least 20 minutes, 30 minutes and come back and we'll slice. All right, we are ready to go here, guys. I can't wait any longer. Now just snip off your little strings here. Uh, let's get in here now. I mean, just listen to this, would you? That sound is so perfect. And now here we go. Are you ready? <laughs> Now that is like Christmas magic. Ah, oh, that's just so perfect. Look at that through there, that centre, that beautiful ring of spice in there. Ah, oh, that crackling. I like to call it like a fluffy crackling. You know how sometimes crackling can be crunchy, but it's like really tough and hard. This is like a really beautiful, light, fluffy crackling. Ah, oh, so good. Okay, so the way I would serve this is, Pop a piece out onto serving platter and put your slices out as well. Sometimes it's nice to kind of leave a little bit so you could do a little bit of carving at the table as well. And now I've just literally cut some limes in half and just grilled them in a pan. Just they've got some nice color and some magrut lime leaves here as well. I really love to freshen up this kind of roast because I think it's nice, you've got that kind of heavy meat, um, but then you've got that beautiful spicing through the center and then that lovely fresh green around the outside. And then of course we have our sauce. So there you go guys, a really impressive main course for Christmas, uh, but also very easy if you take it step by step with all the little tips and tricks. Now I need to get in here because you know, oh, there's pork. <laughs> <laughs> okay, some pork, some of my sauce, mm. I mean you can hear that right, <laughs> that crunch is insane, oh that is such a beautiful way to do pork. The spicing in there is, it's just so fresh. Like I think oftentimes like a really heavy roast can seem, I don't know, like kind of heavy, but with all that beautiful spicing, all those aromatics in there, this just seems so fresh and lively and mm, so much more interesting. Oh, I love it. Mm. 
so good. And some stuffing too. Mm. Ah, yum, that stuffing is so good. Sticky spiced glazed ham. Oh yeah, this is like one of my all time favorites. And then we've got a whole bunch of other things going on here. We have the most epic green beans. We have the most amazing kimchi cheesy party starters. This is my very Merry Christmas. We have a fair bit of work to do in this episode. Now we're gonna get started first of all with the marinade. Now marinating a ham isn't like a very typical thing to do. I like to do it because you get a whole lot of spice and flavor in there rather than just sort of glazing the outside of the ham. So if we start off here with some ginger, garlic, some red Asian shallot. So you could also use some red onion here as well some chilies. Now I am using a mild chili today. I know you guys know that I love things super fiery, but you know, when it comes to Christmas, you've got a lot of people over, you want to kind of please the crowd. And now for some spices here. So I've got some Chinese five spice. And then here is like my super top tip for um, spicing a ham. So Typically or traditionally, cloves, you would see cloves, whole cloves kind of studded into your ham and they really do give your ham a beautiful flavor. But what happens is you make a sandwich, you slice some ham and you're like chomping, like chomping into bits of, of clove, which is not very nice, but I love that flavor. So I put it in my marinade and then I don't need to have the little bits of the clove sticking in everywhere. Now I'm gonna add some Chinese Shaoxing wine here as well. Um, and the reason why it's always great to add in an alcohol to your marinade is that alcohol is a really good carrier of flavor. So um, that liquid is, a, is really thin and it can seep into your ham and carry the flavor with it. Um, sometimes I'll do a spiced rum, sometimes a whiskey, um, but this year it's going to be Shaoxing wine. Now this year because I've chosen to do quite a sweet glaze, I want to keep my marinade kind of tangy. So I'm going to add in some malt vinegar here. And this just needs to get blended. All right, so I'm just gonna pour this in here for later because I wanna get on and do my glaze next. So every year I choose a different kind of theme or flavor for my uh, glaze. And this year I'm doing mango. Uh, because I am here in Queensland in Australia this year, you know, often I'm in Bangkok in Thailand, so I might choose something that's more seasonal there. But this year it's mangoes. So I just wanna cut the cheeks off and this is actually what I would do sort of a day or two days before Christmas. I mean, I would get my ham ready, the marinade, the glaze, everything ready to go so that on Christmas morning, all I'm doing is just baking and glazing. So that's me on Christmas morning. Christmas. Now to my mango, I'm gonna add some mango juice. Oh, and one other thing here, if you um, can't get fresh mango where you are, you could use frozen or even tinned mango here. Um, it, it actually would be quite nice, like if you were somewhere cold to have a bit of like a tropical kind of flavor, I think. <laughs> I want some maple syrup here and some soy sauce. Now this needs to get blended too. Okay, so I'm gonna pour this into my saucepan here. I need to add a few more flavors. And I wanna add some bay leaves here. So these are fresh bay leaves and to give them their best chance of like releasing all their flavor, I'm just gonna give them a little um, clap, if you like. And then, mm, like I can already smell them now. Okay, so that goes in and then some star anise. And I wanna get that heating up. I just need that to simmer until it's just thickened slightly, like 10 minutes or so, and also so the bay leaf and the star anise kind of infuse in there. Okay, so the ham itself. Um, now, you can go your own adventure um, with your ham. You, everyone will probably have a different ham available in their area, so um, that's okay. But you wanna have one that has a skin on. It's a cooked ham as well, so it's already cooked through. We don't have to worry about that. Um, but what we do wanna do is take the skin off so that we can keep some of the fat because we're going to score the fat and that's what we're going to glaze with our beautiful mango mixture. So to remove this skin, you just need to start on an edge here and just 
slice into there a little bit and then use your fingers to just gently release the skin from the fat. Okay, so now that we've got our fat here, what we wanna do is score that. Now you can go in uh, like a more sort of traditional diamond pattern. Now I'm just gonna go for actually straight line score marks that are around half a centimeter. Now the marinade, we just pour that over the top and rub that all over the ham. So make sure you get right in there on that cut side as well. And particularly on that fat side, I just kind of like to just pack on all those aromatics and make sure that we're gonna get as much marinade as possible seeping into all of our score marks. Ah, so this is currently smelling so beautifully like Christmas for me. I love it. It's, you know, even the preparation of all my food for Christmas, I enjoy all of it, including this. So this is going to go into my fridge, make my fridge smell like Christmas. <laughs> uh, and you want to be doing this the night before, so this needs to marinate overnight. Or maybe I'll have some more of this. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna finish off our ham a little bit later on. I've also got some cookbooks to give away a bit later on, so stick around, but, um, oh, and tell me also, again, if you've just joined, what are you doing for Christmas? I would love to know. I'd love to know what you're cooking. Um, now, I'm gonna do here um, a green bean recipe which goes with like anything Christmas time. It has this awesome hazelnut, ginger, bready kind of crumb, uh, which is really Christmassy and really delish. So it's really easy. Start off with just an egg white. Some brown sugar, some ground ginger, cinnamon, and just a little pinch of cloves. Some salt in there, and just give that a whisk. I want some hazelnuts. And then tip it out onto a tray lined with some baking paper. Now this gets baked 170 Celsius for 15 minutes, but halfway through, come in and just give it a bit of a stir. Now for the green beans, just a little bit of technique here. So I wanna pop my green beans into some boiling water and I want them crunchy but charred. So to do that, I just blanch them for about three minutes, then put them into some ice cold water to stop the cooking, keep them nice and green and then just drain them on some paper towel. Now, if you've got your barbecue going at Christmas, which you often do here in Australia where it's warm, um, you can do this on the barbecue or on a char grill pan or a frying pan in your kitchen. Just get the pan really hot. Beans go in. And cook these, tossing them around every so often until they're beautifully charred. Now toss them with a little bit of olive oil, some chopped parsley. And some salt. Now just pop those out onto a plate. With your hazelnuts, you might just need to break them up a little bit. Sprinkle them on top. There you go, Christmassy char grilled green beans. Okay guys, so let's get back to finishing off our ham. Now, this is a ham that I've had marinating since yesterday. Now, before we get to preparing and glazing and baking our ham, why don't we give away some cookbooks? Uh, now, as you guys might know, I have released a new cookbook this year. Uh, it is called Always Delicious, and it is all about all the little tips, techniques, um, all of my most treasured recipes, uh, all together in the one little collection. Uh, so that is my new cookbook, Always 
delicious and I have some copies to give away. So why don't you guys write in the comments below your favorite Christmas menu. Could be this year's Christmas menu or um, a past Christmas menu that you loved. I would love to hear all about it and the five most delicious or interesting or amazing sounding Christmas menus uh, will win my brand new cookbook, Always Delicious. So there you go guys, please tell me all about your Christmas because I love to read about it. Now, because I have a whole lot of marinade on my baking tray here um, and that will burn, uh, what I want you to do is lift your ham onto uh, a baking tray, clean baking tray lined with foil. Now, I always wrap the um, hock part of the ham with some extra foil. And now take your glaze and you just very generously slather that glaze all over your ham. Now there's a lot of glaze here and I like that because um, I probably won't even use all of this um, throughout the, uh, the cooking of the ham. I'll just simmer it again after I finish cooking the ham and then serve it on the side. It's a little extra kind of sauce to drizzle over the ham. Now just pop this into the oven, 180 Celsius, and I want you to bake the ham around about an hour, 45 minutes or an hour. The ham itself is already cooked, so this is all about getting that luscious, sticky glaze. So I just bake it, I baste it every 10 minutes or so until it's really lovely, golden and sticky. Okay, so while our ham's in the oven, let's make some make-ahead kind of yummy, cheesy party starter things because, I mean, you always need something like that in your freezer. These are my kimchi and cheese puff pastries, and it's very easy. So take yourself some store-bought kimchi, or you can look up um, my recipe for homemade kimchi. And actually, this is pretty fun. I do this some years. Um, if I serve this, I'll use my homemade kimchi, and then I'll keep little jars of homemade kimchi uh, in my pantry or under the tree. And then when someone says, oh my goodness, I love that pastry, I can be like, well, here you go. Here's some Here's some kimchi so you can make it too. So anyway, it's just a cute thing that I like to do some years. Um, okay, so kimchi. So I'm gonna add some gochujang to that as well. And some spring onion. I'll just mix that together. So to ensure maximum melty, like, you know, dramatic cheese ball, um, I like to use some mozzarella. Don't use the fresh here. That's just gonna melt and it's too wet um, for the pastry. So um, you want a nice sort of bulb of mozzarella or a block and some nice thick slices. And now with your pastry, you want um, a store-bought puff pastry. You can go ahead and make your own if you like, but you know, I think you don't really need to be a hero with everything at Christmas. <laughs> so take the shortcuts where you can. Well, that's what I do anyway. Uh, so uh, puff pastry, just roll it out. And you need two sizes here. First of all, a slightly larger size. I'm going with an eight centimeter here. So this is for the top of our puff pastries. And now for the bases. So roll that pastry out again. Uh, and this one is about a 7.5 centimetre pastry cutter, so just slightly smaller. So take yourself one of the smaller rounds. So now just put a little bit of kimchi on each of those rounds and some nice thick chunky pieces of mozzarella. I like to go hard on the mozzarella. It means that you, there's the possibility of, of cheese explosions, but I don't know, I don't mind. The more cheese, the better. Okay, so now I'm gonna get my pastry tops and I just kind of like press down on the edges around the filling and then I get a fork and just crimp the edges so I get a really nice seal. And just pick that up off your board and onto a tray lined with baking paper. So at this point, you could put these into the freezer and then once they're frozen, then you can just scoop them up and pop them into little Ziploc bags and have them ready to bake uh, whenever you need them. Uh, but we're gonna get these baked straight away. So what you wanna do is do a little egg wash. Just 
brush each pastry. A little sprinkling of black sesame seeds and then bake these for 15 minutes until they're really like puffy and golden and like oozing cheese. Mm. Yum. Can we end Can the video now? <laughs> <laughs> it's Friday afternoon. <laughs> Okay, so these are looking very puffy, golden, delicious. Uh, but we did have one little disaster here. <laughs> so here we go, this guy got a bit excited in the oven. <laughs> There's just like cheese everywhere. But you know, that's gonna be for me. <laughs> I don't mind, I don't mind an ugly duckling pastry. But pop your other little friends out onto a plate. And there you go guys, it's all cheese and spicy and yummy things in here. Should we get in here and have a look? Let's have a look. Oh, look at that cheese. I mean, come on. Oh, so good. Oh, let's, have, let's get in here. Oh. Oh. You know, for me, kimchi and cheese is like, a little match made in heaven. It's so good, it's like spicy and creamy. Mm, that's like the ultimate little pastry. Mm, yum. So good, mm, yum. Okay, so my kitchen is currently smelling amazing. This is the point on Christmas morning where I start to get really hungry. <laughs> uh, let's have a look at our ham. I have been glazing it every 10 minutes or so, so it should be really lush right about now. Okay, I mean, to me, this is like the perfect ham. It's beautifully sticky and glossy, and I can smell all of those extra flavors that we added in with that marinade, which I think really gives you like something extra, extra special. Oh my goodness, look at how Christmassy and beautiful that looks. I mean, oh, to me, that's just Christmas on a, in a ham. <laughs> Well, ham is Christmas to me, you know, I just love it so much and I love it when things look really beautiful. Okay, but of course I'm gonna taste this, make sure that I've done a good job for you guys. Mm. Yum, 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 yum. Do you know what I love about that? Is I can taste all those beautiful spices and the aromatics. And then you've got that little pop of sticky sweetness that you get on the top from that glaze. Mm. That is. Christmas in a mouthful, I love it. Oh, yum. I have all the little tricks and tips for making my ultimate roast lamb, plus like a few like kind of sneaky weird ingredients. <laughs> First of all, let's talk lamb. So I have a lamb leg here. You could totally do this with lamb shoulder as well. Um, but I have a, a very large leg here. And what I wanna do, whether it's lamb or whether it's shoulder, I really like to score the fat on the lamb because it means I'm getting a lot of marinade in there. Um, and it's also allowing a lot of the fat to kind of render out as it cooks. So just want to kind of score in a diagonal pattern first and then diamond. And now the first step for my ultimate lamb is the marinade. Okay, so very simple here. I want some miso paste, soy sauce. I know, not your typical like roast lamb ingredients, but trust me, this is going to be really amazing because you have the miso paste and the soy sauce just giving you all all that not just the salty things but that umami kind of thing as well which you guys know that i love um, and some honey as well a little bit of honey for some sweetness now give that a good mix now there's a bit of a setup here for uh, your lamb in the roasting tray so i've got some red onions here that are just sliced in half um, and that's going to act like a trivet so that our lamb isn't sitting on the like hot bottom of the tray. So we've got some nice air flow around the lamb when it's in the oven. Okay, start there. Then we want to take some rosemary because mm, rosemary and lamb, they are like best friends. So rosemary on top of that. Now our lamb goes on top and then we want to pour our marinade all over. 
Now really give that a nice rub. I want to make sure that's everywhere in every kind of nook and cranny here. Now, I know usually you guys know that I would always advocate for the fastest route to eating good food, but this does need an overnight marinade. Trust me on this, it'll be worth it. So, in the fridge overnight. Okay, so I did make one yesterday, just so you guys don't have to wait around watching paint dry. Wouldn't that be funny though? We'd just literally like watch the fridge for like 24 hours. No? Good? <laughs> All right, we don't have to wait. Okay, so this one I did yesterday. Now, a few final steps here to get our lamb ready for the oven. First of all, I like to add in some nice tomatoes here. I love the color um, of the tomatoes at the end, but I also love the kind of um, umami flavor and savoriness that it lends to our finished sauce as well that's in the bottom of the tray. So, tomatoes. And now, so we've got our trivet with the onion, we've got our beautiful sort of fragrance happening with the rosemary. We also need some liquid here. So I'm just gonna grab some Chinese cooking wine and you could use white wine or red wine as well, uh, but I want like a good sort of two cups of liquid in the bottom here. And what that liquid's gonna do is it's going to allow a lot of steam and moisture to sort of get around that lamb. So we're, we're ending up with a really nice and juicy lamb. Because no one wants dry lamb. I guarantee no one wants dry lamb. Unless you're like crazy, which we're not. But anyway. All right, so this guy is nearly ready. We're just gonna tuck him up a little bit, you know, so he's nice and snug. First of all, I want some baking paper. Baking paper does two things. It really kind of allows more of that steam to kind of get around. Also make sure that nothing's gonna stick to the foil that we're now gonna put on top. And you want a really nice tight seal here. As I said, I want things to like steam and be juicy in there, and I don't want that steam to escape. Now, first part of this cooking is all about low and slow, getting things nice and tender. So pop this in the oven, three and a half hours. Yes, it's a long time, but you don't have to do anything. Literally, just go have a coffee, or we'll actually, no, we have to make a sauce, but that won't take long. Anyway, let's get this in the oven. All right, so when I've got people over, the last thing I wanna be doing is like last minute worrying about making a pan sauce. Like, is it gonna get lumpy? Is it gonna be a disaster? So I love anything sauce wise that I can make in advance. So we're gonna do, this sauce is like a two step sauce, but most of it gets done before anyone even gets to your house for dinner. So it's really, really a good, really good keeper. Okay, first of all, we're gonna start off with some tomatoes. Now I love to use the whole peeled. I think they seem to have a little bit more like of a concentrated flavor. I kind of like that kind of chunky texture too. Okay, some more miso paste. Now I swear, I know I love miso paste. I, I really, I do not have shares in a miso paste company. I just, I just love the extra flavor that you get. Like you get the salty, but you also get the extra savory and all those, you know, bits and pieces. So some miso paste in here. And I want some oyster sauce. Okay, now I also want some vinegar here. I know slightly unusual ingredient for like a sauce, but I really love that just hint of acidy kind of tang that a vinegar adds here. And just a little sprinkling here of some Chinese five spice as well. Okay, so now for like the extra interest, as if like oyster sauce, miso paste, and a whole bunch of weird ingredients aren't interesting. We're gonna get even more interesting. Okay, I want some star anise in here. Now all we need to do here is warm this through a little so that miso paste starts to dissolve. Um, I'm gonna kind of like mush up some of those tomatoes a little as well while I'm here. And just when that starts to bubble and everything's kind of looking well combined in there, I'm just gonna turn that off and just wait for the lamb. So currently you should be smelling all the things right now, the lamb, the rosemary, the deliciousness. Um, let's have a look and see how our lamb is going in here. All right, so this guy is kind of like half dressed for the party right now. We have a really beautiful tender leg of lamb here, but we need to really develop more of that lovely charred color on the top. Before we do that though, I wanna get going on our sauce or finish off our sauce. So you can see all those pan juices in the bottom here. Liquid gold, my friends. Just scoop most of that out as much as you can. Pop that into that tomato sauce base that we made earlier. Just that final little scoop, kind of just drizzle that back over the top of your lamb there. Okay, so now I want your oven up really hot. 
and this goes back in for another 30 minutes or until everything is looking really delish. So while that lamb is in the oven, uh, we are just going to heat this sauce up because we've got all of that lovely pan juice in there and you just want to keep this kind of heating up and warm and all of that pan juice and the tomato, they'll like make really good friends in there. Okay, so we are literally at the end of the marathon. <laughs> um, actually, I think you could run a marathon quicker than you could cook this lamb. That's right, isn't it? You can run a marathon. People run marathons in like an hour, right? So anyway, um, <laughs> this is this takes longer than a marathon. Um, anyway, we are nearly ready to serve up our lamb. What I want to do is get some of these gorgeous tomatoes out and onto a plate. Now your sauce, you can just have on the side, um, put a little bit on the plate as well, but this is the kind of texture that you're looking for with the sauce. See how like thick and awesome that is? And like, we didn't even have to do very much at all. No fiddling with the pan sauce kind of stuff. So that's what I love about that one a little bit of fresh rosemary. And there you go, guys. My ultimate roast lamb. I mean, I know it might seem a little unusual, but wait till you try it. I mean, should we just get in there and have a look? Let's get in there and have a look. Holy smokes. I mean, check out that color, the juiciness. I mean, this is what I'm talking about, guys. So like, you've got that ultimate kind of like charry crustiness on the outside, and then you've got that beautiful pink, tender, like juicy stuff going on in the middle. I mean, that is crazy good. I need to get in here and try this though. Uh, so, so we want lamb, lots of that kind of sauce. Mm, it smells so good. Okay, that is so out of control good. You know what's amazing about it is we've used no salt throughout the whole recipe, but the soy, the miso, the tomato, I mean, that's added like, this guy is like perfectly seasoned. It is so beautifully, beautifully tasty. But the texture of that lamb, it is so melt in your mouth, soft and delicious and like all the things. Guys, you have gotta be making this for like all your friends. So good, yum.